Good morning. It is uh, 11 a.m. and we are going to begin our uh, meeting of the Board of Regents on Tuesday, March 6th in the Eisensee Boardroom. Uh, we do have a quorum, so I'm calling the meeting to order. And if we could begin with a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Guy, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join us as we read together the mission statement of Del Mar College. Del Mar College provides access to quality education workforce work preparation, preparation, and lifelong life learning life for student and, and community success. And as a reminder, the Del Mar College is streaming the live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting as considered closed session by statute. I would also remind you to please uh, silence your cell phones, iPads, uh, personal noisemakers, anything else that could be distracting in the meeting. And also, Regent, just to remind you, we've tweaked the mic system a bit. And so remember that any rustling paper will show up on our hidden mic. We'll, we'll do things in the meeting. So please kind of be a little uh, aware of that for distractions. And with that, we're going to go into closed session. So please remain seated while I read the language, and then we will clear the room. Closed session per Texas Government Code 551.074A12, Personal Matters Regarding Appointment, Employment, Evaluation, Reassignment, Duties, Discipline, or Dismissal of a Public Office or Employee, or to hear a complaint or charge against an officer or employee, including one Delmar Policy A5.508 Appeal with Possible Discussion and Action Open Session, and B, Texas Government Code 551.071, Consultation with Legal Counsel Regarding Pending or Contemplated Litigation, or a settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. It's 11.02 and we will clear the room at this point. It is 12.02. Uh, PM and we are going back into open session. Do we have anyone that would like to make a motion? Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we uphold the investigative findings and deny the appeal as discussed in closed session. We have a I motion to, and we have a second. Uh, Regents, any further discussion? Any public comments on the motion on hand? Hearing none, let's do a roll call vote if we could, Delia, please. Dr. Adame? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Estrada? Yes. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes. Mr. McCampbell? Yes. Ms. Massbarger? Yes. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mr. Watts? Abstain. A motion carries uh, eight, four, and one abstention. Uh, Regents, that is all of our morning business. We are going to recess for lunch now. We'll be back in this room at 1 p.m. I would encourage you to be here a few minutes early if you couldn't in your places, so we'll be ready to go at 1 p.m. Uh, adjourn or recessed at 12.04 p.m. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the March regular board meeting of the Del Mar College Board of Regents. I am calling our meeting to order we're back into order after a recess from this morning, so we do not need to do the quorum again. But I do would, would like us to start, uh, as is our typical uh, tradition, and that is to read together the mission statement of Del Mar College. So please join me. Del Mar, Del Mar College, College provides access to quality education, workforce preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. And as a reminder, for those that are uh, in the room today, but also watching on TV or on the internet, Del Mar College is streaming the live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. Uh, again, a reminder to everyone in the room to please uh, silence your cell phones, your eye devices, um, any, anything that might make noise or interrupt the meeting. We'd like to certainly focus on our agenda and our purpose today. And we will pick back up our agenda with uh, recognitions, uh, starting with student and staff. And I'm going to invite Claudia Jackson to the podium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
If I could have Sabrina Lamb and Gilbert Cortinas and their faculty members, Denise Rector and Steve Moore, come join me, please. They thought they were going to get off the hook. <laughs> Sabrina and Gilbert are two of the 17 process technology majors who were interviewed and have presented the academic and the uh, uh, integrity to uh, their work ethic to be presented a Gulf Coast Growth Ventures Scholarship. The, these two individuals receive $4,000 in scholarships. They're going to finish their programs in December, and they are representatives of a, a group of 17 individuals who are uh, being assisted by Exxon and SABIC in this, uh, this endeavor. And uh, at the end of this process, then Exxon, SABIC, and Gulf Coast because Growth Ventures will uh, take a very serious look at uh, whether or not they are going to be uh, a match career-wise, but uh, I would bet money on these two individuals. And so I'm going to ask uh, Sabrina and Gilbert just to give you a little bit of their individual story. They gave these uh, as part of our recognition of the, uh, the Gulf Coast Growth Ventures project a couple of weeks ago on the West Campus, and it was so moving that we invited them to come back and give us a, a brief synopsis of what they had to say then. So, Sabrina. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm very moved to be here. Um, I was just talking to Natalie earlier. Um, I, what I was telling her was I am so thankful to be where I'm at right now. A year or two ago, I would not even think I would be where I'm at right now. I've always dreamed about coming to college. That was my dream for many, 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 many years. And I, I guess I got so emotional that day, the other day at the, at the, 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 the speech I had, because I was, this was what I wanted for so long. And I'm here and, and I'm doing it. And where I'm at right now, it, it's just mind blowing. I never thought I would be here. And to get the training I'm getting right now, I feel so confident to go out into the workforce right now that I would know what I'm doing. And I haven't even finished my degree yet. I'm so thankful for my, my teachers, my, the, all the hands-on we have, our, our pilot plan out there, we have everything. It, I'm so thankful. And I, I couldn't be more than happy to be here at Del Mar College. And I just want to thank you all again for everything that we have here at Del Mar. All the hands-on tools, all the training we have, the teachers, the books, everything that's provided to us. It's, it's amazing. Some people don't get this, and we have it, and we're learning, from, we're learning so much. So I want to thank you all for everything you all do. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. Um, so the last time at our Exxon Scholarship Award Ceremony, I um, was a follow-up for Sabrina's speech. And for those of you who were there, she uh, gave an incredible speech. And it was a very hard act to follow. So <laughs> I, I asked her this time, I said, can I go first? <laughs> but um, no, thank you very much. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gilbert Cortinas. I am a process technology student at the West Campus uh, for Del Mar. And I, as well, have been just extremely blessed over this last semester. Um, for some of you guys who were there at the, at the award ceremony, you, you got to hear personal testimonies on both of our parts. And you do know that there is a story to be heard um, behind each one of the 17 scholarship recipients. And for many of us, we have stories that involve resilience and overcoming adversity and just very powerful moving stories. And so for a scholarship opportunity to be presented to us, for many of us, it makes an impact that goes just beyond a check that's written out and says here go to school you know on us for us it was more than just a monetary gift it was it was literally a blessing and a gift of education uh, it was an investment in our personal and educational growth an investment on our skills and our talents and ultimately in our future so we can go out and and come to school every day um, and not have to worry so much as to how we're going to pay to get to school, but focus more on our education so we can be the best process technicians for our industry. We have an ever-growing industry here in the Coastal Bend, and for us to have taken the idea that we're going to come back to school uh, as returning students, um, I already have a four-year bachelor's degree, and I had to make that commitment to come back to school, and I had to work with my family and say, we're going to make a sacrifice, but ultimately it's definitely going to pay off. This is a great industry to be in, and I am very confident that I have the 
first class instructors here who push me to my limits every day we go to school. They're equipping us with the tools and the education that we need to be successful out there. And it was just a privilege and an honor to have been one of the recipients for the scholarship um, program that ExxonMobil and SABIC had offered to us. So for me, receiving that was just validation that I'm here, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And at the same time, that should be validation for every one of you who is a part of Del Mar's board that you guys are doing the right job. You're making an impact in students' lives each and every day. And for some of us, this impact is just life-changing. We have kids we support. We have families we support. We're making the commitment as older students to come back to college and, and try to have a successful future. And so thank you very much for everything you've done. We're very blessed by it, and we will never forget the, the help that you and, and Exxon gave us. So thank you so much for this. If I can add on, Mr. Chairman, uh, while, while they're still here, I want to point out, uh, Gilbert mentioned it, he's got a, a bachelor's degree already. And for a growing number of students all across the country, community colleges are now their grad school. Uh, they, they get a four-year degree in all kinds of programs and come back and want to get uh, a tangible work skill and a hands-on work skill. So kind of the best of both worlds in that he's going to have a, a hands-on, workable, marketable skill and a bachelor's degree that can help move him up. Right. Uh, and Sabrina, as a, as a young mother and, and working through, uh, you are our, our, our average student, believe it or not. We have uh, moms who are coming back to school to, to make a difference. Yes. And, and uh, just want to congratulate you both and the students that you represent. As many of you know, I have worked with uh, the Gulf Coast Growth Ventures Project for a couple of years now. And to have watched uh, their look of surprise and appreciation and awe when I bring them in to show them our facilities, uh, when they came back from interviewing the students for the scholarship programs, and, and John Mabry, who is uh, the gentleman who, is, who headed up this portion of it, said, you know, Carol, I, I knew you had the, uh, the facilities. I knew you had the instructors we have, after meeting Steve and Denise and, and their, their cohorts on the West Campus. He said, but I wasn't sure until I met the students of what your product was. And he said, having met your students, I know you have the product. So you can't get a better endorsement from somebody who's worked uh, chemical plants all over the world uh, to talk about, I know you had the facilities, I know you had the instructors, now I know you have the product. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well put, Carol. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. We're going to move into staff reports and begin with a proclamation for Del Mar College Library Week, Dr. Beth Lewis. Thank you. Well, I always like it when we get to keep the good news going. Um, we have asked the board uh, to endorse, and Cody, yeah, come on up. This is our Dean of our Learning Resources, Cody Gregg. He's been here since October 1st. Good afternoon. And one of the first things that he wanted to do was really change how everyone interacts with the library, and he's doing that in a very good way. So I'm going to have him read the proclamation. All right, thank you. Every year in April, we celebrate National Library Week. And for this year, we're asking that uh, the board proclaim that week to also be Del Mar College Library Week. So the proclamation reads, whereas libraries are part of the American dream, places for opportunity, education, self-help, and lifelong learning. Whereas libraries everywhere are leaders in improving the quality of life in their communities. Whereas our nation's school, academic, public, and special libraries make a difference in the lives of millions of Americans today more than ever. Whereas academic libraries are critical to student success, retention, and persistence. Whereas librarians are trained professionals helping people of all ages and backgrounds find and interpretation the inf interpret the information they need to live, learn, and work in an increasingly complex and challenging world. Whereas the Del Mar College libraries serve as vital hubs for students, faculty, and staff in need of internet access, information literacy training, learning support, study space, and assistance finding resources. Whereas libraries, librarians, library workers, and library supporters across America are celebrating National Library Week. Whereas communities and community colleges thrive at the library. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Board of Regents and Administration of Del Mar College, proclaim April 8th through 14th, 2018 to be Del Mar College Library Week in honor of the observance of National Library Week. 
We encourage all students, faculty, staff, and community members to visit our libraries and to take advantage of the outstanding resources available to them. <coughs> Adopted by the Del Mar Bo College Board of Trustees this sixth day of March, 2018. Thank you, and you've got some folks from the library here I'd yes. like to introduce. So we have several of our library staff members. We have librarians and library staff members. I'd like to ask them to all stand. There's too many of them to introduce individually. <laughs> and I just wanted us to acknowledge and thank them for the role that they play in student success every day in the lives of the Del Mar College students. And lastly, I would like to ask you to save the date. So part of our celebration of National Library Week will start on Monday, April 9th at 10.30 in the morning here at the White Library on the East Campus and at 2.30 p.m. at the Barth Learning Resource Center on the West Campus. We will have opening kickoff celebrations. We'll have cake cutting and a general celebration of all that libraries do. And then we'll continue throughout the week with various events. We will have open mic poetry nights. We will have game nights. We will have scavenger hunts and other events. So please take advantage of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Dr. Lewis. Yes, ma'am. Are they still bringing the little ones from the different schools to campus? We used to do that several years ago. Not now. We're not. not no. Sorry. Uh, next on the agenda is update on changes to our SACS uh, principles of accreditation. Are Dr. we going to actually act on this resolution? I, it's not posted. To, it's not an agenda item. Gotcha. <laughs> yep. Sorry, that's what, that's what our counselor was just asking us. Yep. So we, we, we aff hardly affirm it <laughs> in a non-voting way, right, Regents? Yeah. Do we need to do a hip, hip, hooray on <laughs> top of that? There's okie dokie on it. Okay. Show up on the night. Show. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, and now, Dr. F. Lewis, updates on changes in SACS. Thank you. Southern Association College, uh, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, uh, in December, voted to change their principles of accreditation. Overall, it's a good thing. They have uh, made some changes that, for the most part, the membership feel very good about. Uh, they listened to 10 years worth of us saying, "Hey, we've already answered this four times in this document. Can we only answer it once?" Um, so let me talk a little bit about some of the things that have changed, but before that, how this specifically affects us. Okay, so Del Mar College, as you know, um, we get reaccredited every 10 years, and we are considered the class of 2021 for reaffirmation, but uh, our compliance certification report is due on March 2nd, 2020. That's 727 days from today, if you're counting. I am. Math is. <laughs> Hours and minutes, do you have those down? Yes, countdown it's on my like phone, it. like a countdown to the vacation. Um, we will have our on-site peer review, or what everybody calls the SACS visit. It'll be sometime between September to November of 2020. If we need to do a response to anything that they had to say, that's due in April of 2021. In June of 2021, the SACS board reviews the peer review reports and they make their decision and they say, yes, they've been reaffirmed or we have some concerns and we need to put them on a monitoring report uh, or they have really messed up and they need to be on probation. Of course, those things won't happen. That happens in June and then the status is announced at the annual meeting in December of 2021. So I don't want any of us to get lulled into a false sense of, oh, we've got plenty of time because we really don't. It's a little less than two years. Uh, and you think, well, that sounds like a long time. It's really not. And in the midst of all of this, I'll be doing a substantive change report for the South Campus, which will be due in fall of 2020. Anytime you do a, a substantial change, then SACS has to approve it. And certainly opening a new campus um, or getting ready to open a new campus is a substantive change that SACS would have to approve. So we'll be doing that in the midst of all of it. So let me talk a little bit about some of the changes to the principles. One of the things that they did is they reordered the standards by 14 topic areas. And it really makes a lot more sense. Before we had core requirements and we had comprehensive standards. Now we simply have standards. And it makes it very clear what they are. They removed a lot of the overlapping and redundant standards where things would get asked four or five times uh, as it was before, there were five different places in the report where they ask about faculty credentials. 
you said the same thing each time <coughs> because faculty credentials stay the same each time in your report. Um, there were also standards that really only needed to be addressed if you were applying for initial accreditation, you had never been accredited before, uh, or as needed in a monitoring report, but for the most part, most people never needed to address it, but those standards were there. And thankfully, they simplified some complex standards where before it would be one standard, but it would have seven parts to it. I'll give you an example. So here's a previous comprehensive standard, 3.3.1.2. The institution identifies expected outcomes, assesses the extent to which it achieves those outcomes, and provides evidence of improvement based on analysis of the results in each of the following areas. And then you can see 3.3.1.1, 3.3.1.2, 3, and on and on and on. So you see all of those different areas. Well, each of those areas could end up being 10 or 15 pages just to respond to that one item in there. Since they're also addressed in other areas of the report, so educational programs, student learning outcomes, also addressed in another area. What they did was simply narrow it down to one principle, 7.3. The institution identifies expected outcomes of its administrative support services and demonstrates the extent to which the outcomes are achieved. Whenever they could, they stripped out all of those 3.3.1.2 and just made it one standard because the other areas were being asked. In other places in the report, they eliminated that redundancy. Very happy about that. So one big change you do need to know about that affects the Board of Regents is that they did add this standard, 4.2.G. The Governing Board defines and regularly evaluates its responsibilities and expectations. This has never been a board requirement before, and there are a number of boards that never do a self-evaluation. Now SACS requires it. Some of the documentation that they're going to want to see, obviously they're going to want to see some statements of board responsibilities and expectations. They'll want to see a schedule used by the board for self-review. They'll want to see board policies and procedures regarding board self-evaluation. This is in green right now because we don't have a board policy that says you'll do a self-evaluation and on these dates and this is how it will be done. They also want to see board minutes or reports detailing the findings of the board self-evaluation. And they want to see materials used as part of the self-examination process, such as expert, uh, excerpts from the board books, retreat handouts, or summaries. Yes, sir. Dr. Lewis, before we move on, uh, Regents, just to let you know, we've already started a dialogue with uh, the administrative team about this. I believe probably we'll use the executive committee to talk about this in one of our planning meetings. And just see if there's any changes that we need to, to make to be responsive to this. You know, we're, as Dr. Lewis indicated, we're a bit ahead of the curve because we already do a formal uh, self-evaluation process. We've been doing that for a number of years. We just want to take a fresh look at that and see if there's anything else we should be doing. The other big part, uh, in addition to compliance with the standards, is the quality enhancement plan. Previously, the quality enhancement plan focused on a smaller part of the institution. We would get together, people would have input on what are the things that really need to be addressed. The last one, for example, was on um, math, mathematics, and improving success in math classes. The, the QEP now, they want it to be comprehensive and tied to the college's strategic plan. So the language has changed and now derived from an institution's ongoing comprehensive planning and evaluation processes enhances the overall institution quality and effectiveness by focusing on an issue the institution considers important to improving student learning success and outcomes. So more global. They want it to not be focused on one particular discipline, but something that affects all students. We have not started that process yet, but we will be doing it very quickly, putting together a QEP team and start investigating different ideas for that topic. Okay, so on the left, that's how we're feeling right now. Um, very soon, we will be feeling like the dog on the right. Um, we've, we've got a lot of really good people who um, are, are standing by saying, I really want to be part of the team, I want to be part of this, which is amazing. Usually, you have to go hunt people down and beg them and 
plead yeah. and we've got people coming to me saying I'd really like to be part of this and I can't ask for anything better than that. So questions, anything I can answer for you? Yes, sir. Question. I don't know if this is appropriate at this time, but I, yeah, I know that we had a uh, medical assistant program that we were starting and and we're looking for, waiting for a SACS review. Thank you. you SACS has actually reviewed it. Mm -hmm. We are waiting now for the coordinating board. Okay. Uh, we sent it into the coordinating board for their approval in November. Um, SACS has all but said, yeah, as soon as we get the approval from the coordinating board, you're good to go. But they can't give us that officially until we get it from the coordinating board. And we keep every week poking them with a stick saying we really would like to know something. But uh, we think it will go. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question regarding the QEP. Yes, we have talked for a while about some dashboard kinds of reporting that the board can be looking at on a regular basis. Is that something that can be rolled or maybe a, a, a outcome of the QEP process might be to help inform some of the dashboard kinds of things? Or, or is it, is dashboard more annual operating and QEP is supposed to be really yes. long-term five-year kind yeah, of that, discussions. That, that is more of an operational kind of output. Okay. Uh, the QEP really is about a some sort of uh, uh, topic that would uh, permeate, permeate the, 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 the entire curriculum. Uh, one that comes to mind is critical thinking. Yes. And it's probably one of the w ones that might be the most... Mm, not the most popular, I would say, but it's one. It's a general topic, some, something like that that could that would be you know woven throughout the curriculum and would be able to be assessed throughout, no matter what topic you were, t uh, what part of the curriculum you were a part of. That that's more in the lines of what they were talking about. Quantitative reasoning might be another. I mean, it's these broad, broad general topics um, that they that they'll be looking for. I think there was there was even one, oh, global awareness is another topic the, that was out there at one point. Now, those are kind of old. Those have been on the shelf for a while. That kind of, I'm dating myself now. But, but, but that's qu how quickly things change with SACS. Um, so it's more of these thematic, um, not thematic, well, thematic topics that, that really permeate the, the, uh, the curriculum. What I wanted to add was what's different now. You know, you can ask yourself, so what's different about this, this SACS visit? Um, SAC COC visit. What's different now is we have gone through our first fifth year report. We went through that, dare I say, with flying colors. Okay, and we have two years to build upon that. We have a heck of a foundation already established, and that's what this is, this whole design is all about. And when we go through uh, the process here in the next couple of years, um, this will be the first completion of the new methodology from SAC. So historically, it's important for us to all understand where we are. You know, we've we've long since left the must statements of, you know, of, of years past. We you know we moved into that first fifth year report with that whole new methodology. QEP. We we accomplished our first QEP. This is our second uh, opportunity opportunity to <laughs> to embrace the QEP. And so there's lots of different things happening, and we're, and we're staying up to speed with the evolution of that. So I just kind of wanted to remind everybody that we have a lot of the work already done, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Is there a place in the QEP discussion for the, the board to have maybe in a workshop session? Because I'm thinking along yes. the lines of when we think about student learning outcomes and student success, um, is it related to civic engagement? Is it exactly. related to, yes. um, to uh, economic opportunity uh, in the region? Are, are there some broader statements about what we think are the community expectations of the college and how does that translate into this QEP process? So you're at the latest um, meeting. Would you, would you talk about some of the latest topics or thoughts or Well, because this is so new. I mean, this went into effect in December at the annual meeting. Yeah. Um, the idea was to move away from what SACS saw as boutique programs, only addressing a few people, a few students, a few hundred, but not overall making a change. I think your idea of how does the college relate to the community, how does the community relate to the college, <coughs> is more in line with the new idea of what they're thinking about for a QEP. We want it to reach all students, not just the students who happen to take these particular classes or this particular major. Okay. So we'll, we'll learn more. Absolutely. And as we come back, we'll, we'll be having regular meetings with the Board of Regents on 
um, how uh, SACS, our SACS process, our reaffir reaffirmation process develops. Tell you, if you'd add something to our, our pending list, we'll make sure that we ha continue those dialogues, bringing some of the things you've suggested, Carol, and updates on this from Dr. Lewis and your, your thoughts too. Dr. Lewis, would you include in the scope um, what's going to be happening at the South Campus, or do you have to wait till you've got bodies in there? We don't wait until we have bodies in there. That's part of that substantive change. So before we can put bodies in there, we have to show SACS, this is our plan, this is our programming. We'll provide them blueprints. We'll provide them everything that they want to see. It's very unusual to have a new <coughs> campus. And so we have to get their approval before we run classes in there. Thank you. Are there other questions for Dr. Lewis? More to come. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lewis is going to stay at the podium and be joined by Dr. Silva, and they're going to talk about the Viking Islander Program, VIP, Dual Enrollment Program for Del Mar College and Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. This has been several years in the making. I know it was discussed before I got here, and I've been here uh, a little over a year and a half now. We're very excited about this program because it truly is – for students to be duly enrolled at A&M Corpus and Del Mar, same time. They will have dual, dual citizenship, in other words. Uh, they'll start with seven hours at A&M Corpus, gradually increase that. The students can live in housing at A&M Corpus, and they can participate in activities and organizations at both institutions. So who are these students? Okay, A&M Corpus Christi, Consider students with ACT scores of 17 or 18 as bubble students. So these are the students we're going to invite to participate in the program. Currently, there's roughly about 400 students that fit in this category that will be extending an invitation to, to participate. If a student completes at least 30 hours with 2.5 GPA or above, they'll be uh, guaranteed admission to AM Corpus Christi, although we're going to strongly advise them to get an associate degree. And I'm going to talk about reverse transfer in a little bit as well. And also A&M Corpus Christi will be uh, the uh, host or the home institution for financial aid. That's because the cost of attendance at A&M Corpus Christi is, uh, is higher than Del Mar College. And so they can qualify for more money with the cost of attendance. And then A&M uh, Corpus Christi has access to state funding. So it made sense for us to have them as a host institution. The next slide will talk a little bit about, thank you, about the management overview. We will have staff from both A&M Corpus Christi and Del Mar College overseeing this program. Currently, the staff has been working together since October, at least. They, uh, our Del Mar College staff is meeting with their colleagues uh, down the road. Uh, and so we're going to share data back and forth, and we have a MOU that we'll be signing with a and Corpus Christi, and the MOU specifically talks about the reverse transfer. So even the students who leave Del Mar College and they go to a and Corpus Christi, we'll be keeping close tabs on them because our goal is for them to be able to get an associate degree from us. And these students will also be having specific orientation programs to assist them to uh, get uh, engaged with a and Corpus Christi as well as Del Mar College. Okay, I have a question right yes, here, but you can anticipate what I'm going to ask. What's that going to do to our music program? Are the kids going to be able to go be in the A&M uh, group, choir, band, especially those uh, classes, and not come here? But they'll be jointly ad admitted, mm -hmm. so they could participate in those programs. We're going to have a um, degree plan for each one of the different fields that we have. That was, and so for the first year, they'll be taking a lot of the core classes, but it, there's nothing that stops them from taking music courses. The majority of their classes will be taken at Del Mar. Mm -hmm. They'll only be taking seven classes at A&M Corpus. Seven hours. I'm sorry, seven hours, yes, mm -hmm. uh, their, first, their first year. So they'll be taking the majority of their classes with us. So is it really just a pre-qualification as a way of providing an encouragement, if not even a hook or a yes. pathway straight to A&M? So they start here like they normally do with a little bit there, and yes. over time they get more and more there? Is yes. That, right. Is that basically what it is? So in other words, you're saying it shouldn't, if they're starting here and they're a music major, they're going to take their music classes exactly. here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Silva. But we just Go ahead, Senator, finish up. Well, let's, but hold on a second, Elva. I think uh, you've got a, a related follow-up question. I think... Uh, Dr. Silva, didn't you say that they could take the classes they wanted over there? 
They'll be taking up to seven hours there, but be very prescriptive. We'll have a degree plan that they'll follow. And so there are music majors. Our, um, our staff will be meeting with their staff to be able to say what did they take the first two semesters. And they're in music. They can definitely still take music classes with us. But they could take some there. They could take some there. I think what well. Sandra's that, concern is that, that the, that's my concern. It's going to cut our uh, organizational classes down, uh, and you can't have a band over there. They practice over there, but they perform over here, or they're here and they perform with them over there. So, so well, let me let me kind of help you with that. Kind of get a scenario of the type of students that we're talking about. And we started off with bubble students, and there's a there's a difference between on the bubble and in the bubble. Okay, so right. I want to kind of we're kind of we gotta so we're talking about the students that are on the <laughs> bubble. They're kind of in that middle middle ground area, mm -hmm. and really what we're talking about doing is attracting uh, students who for, uh, who might be from Houston or the Valley or San Antonio or otherwise be applying for A&M Corpus Christi that just might be in the middle of you know, not quite there, not quite ready to to attend in, in a full capacity at the university. So if we're talking about that student, and that is the targeted audience, and there's about 400 or so that we're, we're looking at um, as per the records that, uh, that we've learned, um, as per the information the university's given us. So if you're looking at those students and we're saying, look, you can still come to A&M Corpus Christi and here's the model. You will be a VIP student and you will then therefore be required as a VIP, VIP student to take these certain classes at Del Mar College. So, um, although they may have originally intended to go to the university, we're saying as a part of your admissions uh, requirements, you will have to start off at Del Mar College and, and attend both. Therefore, therefore, really be adding to our curriculum, not really taking away from our curriculum opportunities. The, 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 um, um, the, the degree programs are going to be very prescriptive. They're going to, they're, they're, our, our faculties are getting together, our, our, our administrators are getting together to talk about making sure that those first two years are largely filled uh, from uh, Del Mar College. In fact, it's going to be, I think, a requirement that they complete the two-year degree at Del Mar College. So if you're, if I'm not mistaken. The, we've talked about that. It's going to be strongly encouraged. Yes, that's, you can't require it. That's right. It's, it, so it's going to be strongly encouraged and required. It will add to, it will not take from. This is the blend model, okay, from College Station. Right, right. And, and so this is an add to and going after students that we wouldn't have access to before. That's what this, that's really the whole Really, students premise. that are going to go to A&M that may even be out of the area that need a little help qualifying. Yes. yes. Exactly. So they wouldn't have thought of us to begin with. Probably not. Are, well, are they going to have pay fees at both places? <coughs> yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, they, they, they would have a tuition fees at A&M Corpus Christi and also tuition fees at Del Mar College. But only for the classes they're taking. So if they take, exactly. you know, seven hours there and, and you know, five hours here, we're going to get five hours worth or six hours, and they're going to get seven hours. It's going to be based on where they take it, right? But they've got to pay the student service fee at both places. Yes, they will. They will be. But if you think of how much they would pay if they would have gone just straight to A&M Corpus Christi. We're a bargain. Uh, yes, we're, we're this really this really has a tremendous impact and offset uh, um, on the students' economics for for sure. Again, this model is something that we've been we've been trying to build this one for a long time. And I'll just tell you, Dr. Quintanilla, I can't tell you enough good things about her and her cooperation from her, her team, her staff, everybody, her faculty, everybody. Things are a changing over there, and I'll just say it out loud. Um, yeah, I already talked about the blend model. This is a model that exists in other places. It's very successful in other places. And the idea that the students can come here and live in the dorms, live in, live in those dorms over there off of uh, Ennis Jocelyn and other places, and maybe even on the island, um, is a big opportunity for those students. Again, we're going to go after, very specifically after, a group of those bubble students. Um, we're hoping, I know we, we've set modest um, kind of numbers at this point to say, well, let's, let's go after them and start with a group of 50 or so. Well, there's possibly five, four to 500 students out there that we're going to go after. Um, these are the students, again, that are on the bubble, in the middle, not quite fully eligible for university uh, admissions. And those are who we're going to go after. So it'll be an add to. We'll be very careful with our curriculum. Um, and, and I would say it wouldn't be any different than what's already happening with those A&M students who are already taking pick and choose classes here at the at the college and it really does add to our student body I, i've got to say those those students whom i've met um come over with a different 
different, uh, just different experiences and everything else. And as a university student taking full advantage of those classes, that's what we want them to do. And if I may, I implore you to keep those uh, organizational band and choir and the jazz band. If they're going, there are a lot of kids from the Valley. I was just judging there and they said, oh, we want to come to Del Mar. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was difficult because we didn't have a dorm. Yes. So now they're going to have a dorm. And as you know, when things have not changed since the 1960s, you spend all your time in a practice room. <laughs> uh, and the dorm was across here, here, you know. So, but since they're going to be in that dorm, they're going to make it easy on themselves. I'll just go be in this band. So I will well, be. Well, quote, I think, on I mean, I, went, I was just scroll back with the first slide. It says no one can apply to be it. They get asked. So they can't just, yes. if they say, I want to go live on the dorms and go to Del Mar College, they have to be invited into the program. Okay. Well, I mean, I just want to keep that in the planning because, Goodness. and thank you so much for opening this up because uh, I can just see all kinds of things, oh, yeah. of course, it's be wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. besides notes. Uh, the, th that's one of the things that I see. It'd be so easy just to go over there because the dorm is there and I can practice there uh, instead of getting a bus probably and coming over here and then going back at 10 o'clock at night or that sort of thing. So if you would just kind of keep that because a lot of times we get something after it's already done and you say, well, you weren't in the planning. So... I'm planning. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So to finish up, in the next few months, uh, we will be having a media event mm -hmm. where we do a ceremonial signing, and we hope at that point we'll be able to introduce you to some of the newly selected VIP students. It's pretty exciting. It Thank you. Any other exciting. questions for uh, Dr. Lewis or Dr. Silva? I had a question, but I think Dr. Uh, Escamilla did a very good job in explaining it. it. I wanted a definition of the bubble student because I, because of my background in education, I know what a bubble student yes, is. Sir. But I thought maybe people watching the the, the board meeting may not know. So, sure. but you've done a good job in explaining what it is. Thank you. Pretty exciting. Uh, Tammy McDonald is going to come to the podium now, and we're going to do our, um, I guess it's annual or maybe semi-annual professional review of contracts. Uh, that uh, come to the board. Good afternoon. Like the chair said, we do a, a semi-annual review of our contracts. It's broken into specific areas of the types of contracts. And as the board instructed last time we did this review, we went ahead and removed the contracts that had expired. And then if there were any contracts that were going to expire this year, we make a note. There is one that will expire, but it was just for a, um, at, at this summer, but it was just awarded for one specific project. So it's not like it's a long-term contract that had several renewals attached to it. So we do have one that will expire, but it's a very specific one-time project. But the rest of the contracts, none of them are set to expire this year. So like I said, we have them broken down into, into different types of categories. Do we have any questions on the contracts? Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty quick review. I want to make sure everyone's had a chance to look at it. And uh, It's the type of service. Can we just roll through the slides, maybe blow them up a little bit, Brad, so we can see the categories on the left? Because it's not just about what the regions have. It's the public seeing what we're... What I'll, I'll go ahead and read the, the category topics. So we have legal, financial, general facilities. As you're going through there, would you highlight the ones that are, uh, that are up for renewal this year so we know what's coming up? Okay. I mean, I said uh, the uh, out of those three, none of them are up for renewal this year. Out of those three categories I just spoke of. So on the Patterson Associates. Patterson, that that one is basically it's it. it's open it's open ended on Patterson Associates. It says automatic renewal. Yes. And it's a term contract, so it just continues unless one of the parties terminates the contract. Augie, from a legal standpoint, we can have open-ended contracts like that. Talk to us a little bit about that. And is that a good, a good way to approach that? I'd have to look at the contract, but I mean, I, I think. I, I guess I'm questioning why would any contract be open or would be auto-renew? Wouldn't we want to periodically good. give them a review? Just scrutinize uh, and I'm not picking on. No. Uh, Patterson Associates, they do a great job. Uh, right. Grays and Doherty, the top one is on that list. And 
The last time we had this conversation, Mr. Chairman, we we talked about open contracts and the like. And the, as I recall, the situation was or, or discussion was that open is a term that's just kind of been that we've used for a long time, and it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it means guaranteed by right. any means. It means that we review and we assess the services um, through our experience from year to year. And I think if we look into the contracts that there's termination opportunities yes. readily um, and in relatively short periods of time throughout those. And I mean, I'm talking 30 day notices and the like. Now we can check those specifically. We want to define it differently other than open, it may be contingent. I mean, there's there's other terms out there I'm not going to practice without a license. It's but not an open contract. Exactly. I get that. I, just, I think it's that term, though. Dr. Eskin, what you pointed to is, I guess my concern is, yeah. when something is the handful that we have that are that are uh, not, that are auto renew effectively, means that unless we purposely, periodically pull those contracts and review them, we'll never really look at them. That's my point. So it, maybe we need, I know Tammy's going to love this, another column in your spreadsheet or some way to say, when is the last time we looked at them? To make a mandatory. Fifteen years later, we're going to go, hey, when's the last time we, we reviewed, yep. you know. Yeah, there's, well, only two, there's only two, the two you just mentioned, that are basically, they continue unless one of the parties terminates them. The rest of them, if they do say auto-renew, they do actually have a specific end date, but there is a capability, let's say it's a five-year contract, with three possible one-year extensions of the contract, then it would say it auto-renews unless one of the party terminates it during one of those option periods for the extra year, but it does have a specific end date. If you do use up all those renewal options, there is an end date. So there are only two that do not have an end date after some of the renews or auto-renews. I think our opportunity here is also to build in a review, a, a standard or a standing reviewing process and column in there so that the so that these things are not um i guess it's going to take a little time to yeah. think about that but I, I get what you're saying though but okay. but they all and we and we have terminated contracts um here in the past several years uh things that were that were categorized under open really were not right um, they have so they have we, the termination provisions like you mentioned anywhere from 30 to 90 days it just depends on the type of contract but building in the processes of 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 reviewing i think is important for us to to clarify here even further right but just just to make mention chair the there are just the as far as um they renew unless the party terminates and there are only those two the rest of them do have some type of an end date even if you do auto renew through the extensions of the contract okay ed did you have a question i've got a question the texas book book company uh that's the bookstore mm -hmm. is that a profit center mm -mm. do we make a profit there we don't consider it a profit Your microphone, center. it's not on, sorry. Just, oh, is it? Okay, yep. it just didn't show from here. Okay, I think it's red. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a revenue center in that we uh, accumulate the revenue that has come in under the contract, and so it's a revenue source. Does, does our revenue exceed our cost? We, don't, we do not balance it that way. Our costs right now are totally uh, utilities and space, and uh, so, yes, I... It does. It's quite quite profitable okay. from that standpoint. Okay. But that revenue goes to scholarships, right? That's not part of the contract. Yeah. It's hmm. uh, not designated it, in the it contract. It goes to auxiliary. It goes to auxiliary funds, and it's and it's right and it's there right now. There's a couple of thousand dollars. Th that, that was a previous book store contract that you're referring to. Yes, sir. I have a question. Why why is there a difference in what architects cost for the emerging technologies as opposed to the uh, workforce development building? One is a six point seventy five, I believe, and the other one is seven point something. I lost it. Those are construction contracts, and that would have to. Yeah. I know August is not here, but basically, I think the those fees are a percent of maybe the work done, and so yeah. the workforce so, building is is quite a bit larger than the actual ET expansion. So. Those fees are proportionate with the type and the, the okay. I would say, the, the volume of the work. Okay. And those were under negotiations some yes. time ago, and um, but we're looking, we're we're watching those very carefully. You're 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 uh, referring to something that's weighing very heavily on us right now as we uh, are negotiating negotiations. Absolutely. 
Not, you know, we cut you off from reviewing a category, so. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, that's okay. Good discussion. Okay, so I think I'm on the, I think you were down on my to second page. So, we, so as uh, Regent Revis was mentioned, the bond contracts is 2014 bond contracts. And then the next category would be 2016 bond contracts. And that list will grow, obviously. That list will grow. We have the one which is in, uh, been negotiated right now. And then we have just general construction. And that is the one contract that's for one specific project that will end this year. And then we have insurance and then campus services. So those are the different categories of the contracts. And the insurance we do every other year, every two years? Now this particular, this is our, just specific for our property and casualty insurance. So this, what, this contract was for so many years plus uh, extension. So that contract will be up in two years. In 2020, it renews every year because just like anybody's insurance, they they look at your your claims history annually, and then they give you a new premium every year annually, which we should be getting heads up, I guess, next month on in April on that. But um, this one will will um, for this particular contract, it's up in 2020. Hey, did you have another question? question? Yes, please. G GCA services. That's the cleaning service. Is that service? Yes. They're cleaning one less building after we knocked down the English building. Did we get a break for that? In the contract, there is listed a schedule of, um, I believe, it, it, of square footages. So anytime that uh, we would add something and remove something, you can go back and adjust that because it's, it's like a square footage. Um, if we have to add something, then we have to go back and, and talk to them about adding it into the contract. But I believe the English building, when this one went into place in 17, the English building had already been knocked down, so it would not have been part of the list. Mm. Okay. Other questions about the contracts? Anything else for Tammy? Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Jackson is going to come up and give us an uh, update on the website redesign in Viking News web-based newsroom. That's a mouthful. <laughs> there have been a whole lot of things going on in the web world uh, on campus, and I'm really excited to share a few of those with you. While I'm doing that, let me just tell you that in doing the website redesign, we had probably the strongest team uh, outside the instructional force on campus in that we had Jessica Montalvo Cummings and the whole IT staff behind us, including Sarah and, and uh, Darcy and Denise and um, all of those folks over in the, making the, the science of web work. And then we also had the college relations team. Jay Keenan was chairing the committee with Jessica and uh, Mon uh, Monica and Ralph and Melinda and uh, uh, Mike and the whole group there was uh, making sure that uh, uh, we were doing the right things there along with Sarah Greer. And then the third leg of the stool was the student development area in that uh, Sarah King and uh, Gracie uh, uh, Mirabal made sure we never lost track of our number one priority, which is the new website is not no longer going to be a repository for documents we don't have any other place to put. It's going to be focused on what the student needs, particularly the potential and the new student. So uh, with that, that uh, we're going to show you a couple of, of the uh, exciting innovations about this. The three main principles, it will be student focused. It will be mobile first, not just mobile friendly, which means it's going to be responsive. Uh, the, this and uh, Viking News and all the other things will be will scale down to be readable on your tablet, on your your uh, iPhone, um, at some point probably on your watch or the camera in your eyeball. I don't know, whatever the new technology is coming. But we're trying to make sure we're staying ready for the next, uh, the current and the next technology iterations. And we got uh, a year and a half into this project and kind of got a new wrinkle, and it turned out to be good in that there was a, a brand new set of ADA compliance uh, requirements from the federal government. And although they are not requirements requirements for the college yet, uh, we chose to go ahead and ex adopt those as our standards because it is, it's, what's the, it's the right thing to do and it will probably be coming down the pike to us for, before very long anyway. And that means that every single uh, graphic in here has to have a description or a metadata for the visually impaired, every video has to be closed captioned. 
uh, graphs have to be explained. It's a much more complex way of presenting all the material. So what we have on the public facing website is uh, by and large, particularly if it's something that's just been developed in the last um, few months since we're working on this, those are ADA compliant and Jessica's gonna keep us, keep us straight on that. Jessica and, and Darcy are gonna keep us straight on that and uh, not let us get, get far away from that. Um, the material that's primarily for employees will be in one password protected realm, if you will, and things that are designed for instruction and faculty and students and the teaching world will be in another password protected world. What you're seeing is just the public face. Uh, I'm going to ask Jay to show us a little bit about the toolbox. These are the things, and we can add things to these lists as uh, we see that there's a need. But these are often the documents or the uh, links that are, that are needed most. The catalog, the academic calendar, um, how to get in touch with the help desk if you're having technology problems. All of those are under the toolbox, and we can add to those hamburger menus, those drop-down menus if we need to. The one that will have the most impact uh, directly for you all is over on the right-hand side at, under Info 4. So that is a particular audience-based uh, directory, if you will, so that if we go to the Regents and Community, give Jay just a second to get to. This doesn't exist live. It's still in the... Um, um, the toolbox or the, or the building phase, if you will. Our plan is to take this live in the next 72 hours, no pressure. Uh, but uh, so it, you can't go see it right now, but you will be by the end of the week. So on the, Reg the Board of Regents pages, if you'll click on that one for me, please, sir. And uh, those of you who have shared with me uh, biographical updates over the last few days uh, and weeks, those are going to be already f reflected in here. Uh, if you'll see at the very top of that page, there is a link for watching live. Sometimes it's, it, it's not as easy to find that link to be able to do the live streaming, so it's right there at the top of your page. Uh, and uh, we'll go on from there with uh, just looking at some of the, um, everybody's bios have been updated. And also on the left-hand side menu are things like uh, the calendar, the, the, the board calendar, and then uh, we can also get to things such as bylaws and uh, policy manuals and things like that through this page. Where would that be on the page? I'm sorry? Where would that be on the page if you wanted to go to bylaws? and? The, uh, see, right there. Um, it's hard to see from here. So, it, yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's a list of links that, uh, that appears here on the side of the page here. And... Um, Right now, it's, uh, it's missing. <laughs> it, was there, it was there two hours ago, and we were still working on it. It's okay. You've got 72 <laughs> hours to get it fixed, so there you go. Yeah, okay. it's, but it will be in that, that Yes, it will be right okay. there. And anything that you all decide you need that needs to be added there, all you have to do is let me know. If you would go to the uh, CIP page for me, please, sir. The reason I asked Claudia, the reason I asked Claudia why he's doing that is that uh, you made a comment earlier that this is not designed to be a repository for documents, and yet... It is our, one of our primary ways that we provide public information to people. So I want to well, reconcile. Well, there's a difference there. We're talking about the things that may no longer be relevant, the things that we, or we found when we started looking into the dark corners of the old website, the 10-year-old letters uh, from administrators who are no longer here and things like that. That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes we put things there because we know we can find them. That does not mean we're not going to have everything there that you all or we decide the public needs access to. Got it. Thank you. Um, oftentimes we, we were straying from really staying on, on point with the mission. So our capital improvement page, uh, this is designed to really go back to when you all started thinking about these big bond elections and the fact that the strategic plan, the five-year strategic plan was the leaping off point. And, uh, you'll scroll on, on down, some of the uh, testimonials that we got when we, you were in the process of working on those bond elections and the fact that we are a one college multi-campus system, the fact that you all are um, absolutely uh, committed to finishing these projects on time and on budget and community accountability and the signature programs, 
then we talk about what those programs are that happen as part of the 2014 bond, and then those other two projects that happened in this basically the same time frame but did not have bond dollars attached to them, uh, KEDT and things like that. We've got the we've got a, an incredible opportunity to put videos in this this uh, website that we did not have before. So we've got video testimonials from the uh, signature programs. Uh, deans, the folks that are telling us why did we need to do these things, and we appreciate so much having their their support with that. Thank you, John. <laughs> and then if you'll go on down to the uh, uh, 2016 bond and those video uh, uh, interviews that we gave, uh, we ask you all to give us when you were selecting the architects. They're all scrolled through in this particular section, uh, with the exception of uh, Regent Estrada, and we we got hers this morning. That was also going to have the link for Del Mar Tomorrow, which was the, the bond-specific um, web page that Gensler put together for us, um, and the timeline and the budget and all those kind of things. So um, as I said, we're going to plan to go live sometime between Thursday night and Friday morning on this so that it's, it's ready to go when we get back from spring break. The other big web improvement I just wanted to touch on briefly is Viking News. When we have good news that we want to share about the college, we've had a problem in the past of being able to make sure you could get that information quickly. And also, if it was a video news story, to be able to see the video. I know it was frustrating when I would send something and all you could do was read the script with all of the uh, um, messaging that goes on in, in the, the booth when you're building a video news package. But Viking News is going to be very robust. Melinda Edelman and uh, her team have been working on this for almost as long as we've been working on the website so that we have the option to be able to send something to you not every day but every day that we have major news. Um, we just we had a, an incredible situation with uh, uh, our social media a couple of weeks ago. We had a Facebook post about the American Sign Language for Spanish speakers that got 52,000 views, 20,000 minutes of people actually watching it. it. They didn't just it didn't just flash past their eyeballs, and we got over 5,000 reactions, a like or a share or a comment, and they were from everywhere from New York to LA and North North Mexico. So we know that a lot of what we're doing is getting out there, but I haven't had a good way to get it to you all. So you're going to get an invitation before the end of this week that says, here's, here's our way to get these major news stories to you. You all can uh, accept that invitation, or you may opt out if you choose to, but that'll be an opportunity for me to make sure that you're not surprised the next time you go to the grocery store when somebody says, hey, I saw you guys on channel whatever. Um, the bad news is, because we're linking directly to that newsroom uh, uh, video, I can't take the ads off of it, so you have to have to suffer through the ads with the rest of us, but uh, it will at least be there and you can see it. The only other thing I wanted to share with you is that an, another innovation we're working on is the Viking uh, virtual campus tour and interactive campus maps that are going to make it much more, more uh, robust and uh, easier for students to do wayfinding, uh, to be able to show people what's in a particular lab from uh, a website view and uh, get people from one place to the other, and that's coming soon. I know I've uh, exceeded my, my <laughs> 10 minutes, so. Uh, I know I have a question, there may be others. How, our current website, I know we periodically made changes to it, but when's the last time we did an overhaul like this? It's probably been 10 years, would you right. say, Jessica? And what's the, uh, Two, yeah, what's almost the, what's the uh, eight, best, eight years. What's the best practices in? Well, not not eight years, I don't think. In fact, we're, we're going to accept that this is more like uh, painting a ship. Mm -hmm. We will, can, will begin to make um, additions and corrections to this as soon as we get back from spring break. When the next time we would do a complete review and scrap this and start all over, maybe when the technology changes, we don't know. Our, our hope would be that this would, because we've stuck with best practices uh, nationwide, we've, we've learned from the best, we've uh, listened to the, the students, their focus groups, and telling us what they wanted and what they needed, um, that we would not allow us to get so far out of whack 
again. But I'm Well, and there's the other piece to this, and there's our app that yeah. we have out there. So we have a complementary piece that we've been evolving on a regular basis and, yeah. and actually probably paying more attention to and giving more Viking maintenance yes, to uh -huh. on the Viking mm -hmm. Go app. If mm -hmm. you don't have it, please download it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very comprehensive for our students. Again, this is a splash page that, cons uh, that complements the app. Mm -hmm. and uh, But duly noted, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, a regular uh, maintenance, a regular... Um, uh, nurturing of the evolution of this of this infrastructure is is important. Well, no, and I only brought it up because I went through the same thing recently at work where we woke up and said, "Oh wow, eight years has passed." But a lot of the technology was driving it all of a sudden to make it ADA compliant yes. and scalable, mobile friendly because the mm -hmm. mobile's really right. It's been here. Mm -hmm. But then the other stuff we were reading said, "And we we can't wait this long anymore." So I think that I think that that time frame has shrunk compared to what it was you know even five years ago so yes i don't yeah. i don't think anybody on the team would disagree and, with that and that's important as we plan ahead for budgeting purposes you can't just wake up one year and go gosh right. we need to we need, that. We need sure. to say okay we're going to do mm -hmm. it three years from now and then mm -hmm. plan for it or whatever that number is so right yeah. okay great any other questions for claudia and her team pretty exciting looks nice looks very nice will we get an email when it's uh, live so we can all go Hit it at one time. And see I bet I can, can work that out. Okay. Push that around. Where, Thank you. Where, Claudia, where would people go to see the, the board meeting live? Um, if you'll go back to the board. There'll be one of the, the beauties of this page, different from when we built the last one, uh, is that we will have key information in one place, mm -hmm. but you'll have multiple ways to get to it. Mm -hmm. So on the Board of Regents page, um, Jay, I'll pull it up here right there. The very top there, it says Watch Live. And uh, you'll click that, and you'll, when it's when it's connected, right now this is still yeah. living in a in a beta test world, but you you could click that, and it would immediately go to your live stream screen. Okay. Oh, there's the there's the link I was looking yeah. for earlier. Yeah. Okay. Current yeah, current right. minutes minutes archive bylaws calendars, policies and procedures. Um, the key financial documents would be living on the CFO page and things like that, unless you wanted them, a link from this page to those. The, the good news about this is there's nothing in concrete. It's a, a computer clicks and away we go. Okay. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate your time. Moving to the College President's Report, Dr. Escamilla. Oh, very quick. Sorry. Very quickly on February 26th, I think that was just last week, um, I had the pleasure of serving on the steering committee for the University of, University of Texas's uh, new executive EDD program in higher education leadership. Um, Dr. Victor Sines is the department chair there at the College of Ed. He and I have come to know each other. We do have a program that we're sharing with and partnering with the University of Texas College of Ed. That's our program, Males, uh, which is targeting our, our male students and their uh, um, persistence practices and the, and the like as students. Um, but anyway, I was there last week and got to serve on that first, uh, first committee meeting, and it was really an honor to be around the table with people from all over the state, uh, including John Roosh, who's really regarded as the guru of community colleges anywhere on the planet, and I do not exaggerate. Uh, he, was, he was the uh, previous uh, director of the program for 44 years. That was the program that I graduated from. And uh, since it, it has now moved on, Dr. Sines is putting that program back together. And it's just, let me just tell you, I was just honored to be there. And I look forward to continuing to serving on that committee to develop that new program to bring up new leaders in all aspects of education uh, for the future. And so uh, anyway, that concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. A question. Yes. Where are we on uh, addressing the governor's latest mandate on security issues at community colleges all over the state? We'll get to that here in Everybody just we're, we're, we're going to have something on that here in just a little bit. Okay, no problem. And I, we have information for you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, under Regents' comments, I believe uh, Carol Scott's going to give us a brief update about the National Legislative Summit that she recently attended on behalf of the Board of Regents. Yes, the uh, American Community College, the Association of Community College Trustees, uh, held our National Legislative Summit in coordination with ACCC uh, in Washington D.C. a month ago. So, uh, as you all know, things things change. But I did provide you what was current information as of that meeting. 
the two-page summary document of the federal legislative priorities and then the background document as well so that if you wanted a little bit more information uh, the uh, Texas was well represented our state association uh, had arranged uh, a, almost 25 meetings with congressmen senators and various uh, staff members of, of different committees uh, I actually participated in meetings with um, Senator Cornyn and his legislative staff, as well as the House Committee on uh, Education and Workforce and the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Uh, so we were meeting with folks talking specifically about uh, the legislative priorities at, at the federal level and then giving examples of how those impact us uh, at, at, at a local level. Had some, some great conversations with folks. Uh, and then at the same time also went to the state coordinators meeting and, and did some networking on behalf of the, the college as well. Um, so be happy to answer any questions, uh, but try to provide you with some information that you would have available. Thank you. <coughs> any questions for Carol? Are, are they going to continue the year-round panel? Yes. Good. Yes. That is still, still in the works. And uh, the discussion on Pell was really around the surplus and trying to make sure that that surplus does not get rated for other purposes. Good, Good news. Thank you, Carol, <laughs> for representing us there. Uh, pending business is next, and if there is a, a uh, list of the pending items in your calendar, in your packet, uh, we've covered everything through March today, and there'll be the next uh, uh, set of uh, items that are queued up for the April meeting. Um, we're going to move now on a consent agenda. There is three items listed for consent, the approval of the minutes for the call meeting of February 6th, 2018, acceptance of investments for February 2018, and acceptance of financial statements for January of 2018. Uh, does anyone want to pull any one of these items off for separate discussion? And if not, we'll entertain a motion for uh, the consent agenda. I move to approve, Mr. Chair. Motion by Gabe. We have a second. Yes. Second. I think Sandra said it first. Any further discussion by Regents? Any public comments? All in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Regular agenda item. Item number four, discussion and possible action related to annual ethics training of the Board of Regents, uh, Augie Rivetta. Good afternoon, Regents. Uh, this is your annual board ethics update and review. Um, what I'm going to do, just to give you a heads up, is I'm, we're going to cover basically a walkthrough through some of the fundamental principles that we reviewed last year uh, with some updates, because I think it's important to always cover the fundamentals. And since uh, we are doing this live, it's also a great way to inform the public, your community, as to uh, the ethical principles that uh, you believe very strongly in, that you govern yourselves by, and that frankly are the best practices across the country. Uh, you'll recall that back in the fall of 2012, an ad hoc committee of this board chaired by Regent Hutchinson, together with Regents Estrada, Rivas, and Watts, conducted a review of the board bylaws and your statement of conduct and ethics. And there were changes proposed that were adopted by the board. As a result of the committee's work, the board reaffirmed its commitment to operating in accordance with the highest ethical standards, and every year you renew this commitment by conducting an ethics review and by signing a code of ethics pledge, which is based on the bylaws and the statement of conduct and ethics. Uh, just to give you all an update, uh, most of you have been uh, very involved at the state and national level in promoting ethics. Since 2015, uh, this board, uh, together with your president and myself, have appeared on several panels and spoken at the community college, on community college ethics to other trustees and administrators from across the country 
at the ACCT National Leadership Congress as well as the Texas Association of Community College Attorneys Conference. So you're not only uh, uh, preaching it, but you're practicing what you preach and taking it uh, at, the, at the national level. And I need to say that in the time that we've been doing this at ACCT, it continues to be one of the few you know, ethics-oriented presentations. Um, so we'll keep doing it as long as we can, and it's always been very popular. In fact, at the Congress last September, Regents Messbarger and Rivas uh, joined us in a well-attended roundtable. Wasn't it well-attended? To get another uh, room. <laughs> the roundtables are truly roundtables, and they anticipate seven to eight trustees. We had 15 or 20, or 20, and we had to go appropriate another room. Uh, I facilitated uh, the roundtable session, which was uh, entitled Effective and Practical Board Ethics, a guided tour through policies and bylaws. Uh, these were the roundtable talking points, just to give you an idea of the kinds of questions that we take. Do ethics matter? What's the relationship between high ethical standards and effective leadership? How do you recognize and effectively respond to unethical behavior? And what are the potential legal and other consequences resulting from a failure to adhere to high ethical standards? I think we got through the list, but um, there was a particular community college that I won't name that came to us from New Jersey. There was a trustee there, and they had been on the front page of the New York Times for like several months running for all sorts of issues, so we got kind of tied up with that. Um, the takeaway points from the session, these are the kinds of things that we're taking from your experience here and the kinds of ethical principles that you follow here and adhere to here, and we take and promote nationally. Number one, develop or update an official written formal ethics statement that applies specifically to the board duties and responsibilities and include the statement in the board bylaws and college policy. You guys already do that. You review board bylaws and college policy on a regular basis. You guys already do that. Ensure that every new board member is provided with a new member orientation that includes ethics training, conflicts of interest, restrictions on gifts and honoraria, reporting requirements, open government laws, board bylaws and policies. Frankly, you're required to do that in our state by the Higher Education Coordinating Board, but then every one of you has a one-on-one -on -one with legal counsel and we go over some of those things as well. Uh, number four, conduct a regular board ethics update and consider having board members affirmatively recommit to the highest ethical standards. You already do that. Uh, address ethical violations swiftly and decisively. I think you do that. And finally, volunteer to speak at ACCT or other trustee conferences on board ethics, and most of you have done that. Uh, so why are ethics so important to the board? I, just, I found uh, an, interesting, um, uh, an interesting forward in a book that I, that I read recently. Gives you the kind of idea of the kinds of books that I like that are interesting. So in his forward to the book, Ethical Leadership in the Community College, the distinguished George R. Boggs, which many, who, whom many of you know, he's the former president and CEO of the American Association of Community Colleges, he offered the following observations. Leadership in our society is a privilege that enables the leader to impact both organizations and the lives of people, but it also carries many responsibilities. Perhaps the most important responsibility for anyone who is in a position of influence is to honor the public trust. Community colleges, for all the good that they do for individuals, exhibit the same type of lapses in ethics that we find throughout society. Why do these lapses continue to occur? And what can be done to strengthen the ethical foundations of our institutions? Restoring public confidence can only happen if we begin to make ethical behavior a significant value, especially for leaders in our institutions and organizations. It is important to think seriously about ethical values before one is faced with difficult and ambiguous dilemmas that are all too common. Ethics statements do not guarantee ethical behavior, but they do serve to remind leaders that ethical considerations should guide their behavior. So where, where do we find, where do you find the, the, the ethical principles that you follow? Uh, well, number one, and these are in the file folder that are passed out, and another copy for your uh, file of the bylaws, it's section nine, uh, subparts A through I, that's where you have your statement of conduct and ethics. You have a, 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 that is basically, that's essentially mirrored and made part of formal college policy, and that I believe is because of SACS. SACS requires us to have it in both policies and bylaws, Dr. Lewis, so there you go. So that's why even, in, it's, it's doubly stated. You've got it in your bylaws, it's how you govern your board, and then it's also a matter of college policy under B2.1.2. 
And then finally, um, this really came out of the hard work that uh, Regents Hutchison and Rivas and, and Estrada and Mr. Watts did uh, back when you all went through this review. You thought it was a great idea. It wasn't unique to us. We didn't come up with it, but you saw that other community college boards affirmatively said every year, yes, I recommit to ethics. It's important. I've read this. I've gone over it, and here's my signature. And so you've got the code of ethics form, which is not exactly verbatim. I think we liked the way it was phrased a little differently. Uh, it was a little more personal, and that's why we have the code of ethics form in a little different form, but it's what you sign annually, and there's a copy of that that I'm going to ask each of you uh, to sign before uh, we conclude the meeting today. So this in very, very small type, uh, but mostly for the outside world, is a copy of that code of ethics form. And you'll see that it's got 11 enumerated um, uh, commitments to ethical principles, and some of those we're going to go. So where do we come up with these? I mean, are these unique? Are these special to Delmar College? No. Uh, in fact, uh, ACCT has a guide to ethical governance, and I think we all recognize that ACCT, I mean, as the national organization for community colleges, uh, is, is going to be at the forefront of promoting best practices and how you should be governing yourself. So ACCT says that governing boards function best when the ethical standards for trustee behavior are clear. They recommend that all boards adopt a set of standards called the Code of Ethics or Standards for Good Practice. Uh, some regional community college accrediting commissions already require that boards have a Code of Ethics or similar statement in place. SACS requires you to have such a Code of Ethics or similar statement in place. This is their model code. Uh, and they encourage Board of Trustees to follow this code. First, as a governing board member, I'm required to devote time, thought, and study to the rules and responsibilities of a community college board member so that I may render effective and creditable service. So study, do your homework, come prepared, and, uh, be, and, and be ready to talk about it. Uh, also, you will work with your fellow board members in a spirit of harmony and cooperation in spite of differences of opinion that arise during vigorous debates of points of issue. Are you always going to agree with each other? No, that's not unethical. It's how you deal with it and how you deliberate it and how you decide and how you move forward from that uh, 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 disagreement that matters. You base your personal decision on all available facts in each situation. Vote your honest conviction in every case, not your dishonest conviction, I guess, and, and, and your not be swayed by partisan bias of any kind and abide by and uphold the final majority decision of the board. It's important that once you make a decision as a board and you move forward and the majority has spoken that you accept the decision and you support the decision and support the action. Remember at all times that as an individual you have no legal authority outside the meetings of this board. When you come here in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act and you are meeting as a board of nine that's where your authority comes from. That's where your power comes from. You have the power to exercise a vote. Um, outside of that, you really don't have any authority, and you're supposed to conduct your relationships with community college staff, the local citizenry, citizenry, and all media on the basis of this fact. Resist every temptation and outside pressure to use your position as a board member to benefit yourself or any individual or agency apart from the total interest of the community college district. Uh, that thing, temptation, it comes up, right? And you're out there all the time. Uh, but you need to recognize that it is important for the board to understand and evaluate the educational program of the college that it, uh, as it is to plan for the business of college uh, operations. Welcome and encourage active cooperation by citizens, organizations, and the district media by communicating with respect to policy on current college operations and proposed future developments. Speak with one voice as a board member once a board decision or policy is made. Again, is that going to, does that mean that you're always going to agree with each other? No, but once a decision's been made here, after it's been duly posted and noticed and you voted on it, then you move forward as one voice. Uh, support the state and national community college trustee associations. I think your representative in DC recently did exactly that, Regent Scott. Strive step by step toward ideal conditions for the most effective community college board service to your community in a spirit of teamwork and devotion to public education as the greatest instrument for the preservation and the perpetuation of our representative democracy. Pretty heady words. And, and, but, you know, obviously ACCT puts them in there for a reason. They're not to waste time, they're to 
for you to look at and deliberate and think about and, and to go back to and remind yourself of you know where what it means to be ethical. Now, last year I told you about a wonderful resource, the Community College League of California Trustee Handbook. It's pretty thick. It's almost 200 pages long. They've done a, an amazing job. And, and in this spirit of networking and, 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 and speaking to our friends at the state level, uh, uh, Dr. Scamia and I have talked about this, and I've talked to Jacob Freire, the executive director at TAC, about the idea of ultimately doing something like this for Texas. But if you haven't read it or if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I, I commend it to your attention. And we're going to do a walkthrough through some of the ethical principles that come from this uh, trustee handbook. It really is pretty phenomenal. I think it's the only one that I have found uh, from across the nation. Uh, and it is, it is, it, and, and there's a reason we're going to go through it. And I, and I want you to start thinking. And at the end, I've talked to the chair about this, about something you may want to do uh, coming out of this session. So uh, I won't go through it all, uh, but I mean, this is from the, the middle of the book, and this is where they have a whole section dedicated to ethics. Um, but I did like this particular language. Trustees and governing boards have the responsibility to be both ethical and legal. And I think I've actually heard more than one of you say before, uh, Regent Messberger, I think you've said this before, that there, it's one thing to be legal, and sometimes it's another thing to be ethical. But there are those, those can be two different things. Ethics are standards of right and wrong, good and bad. Uh, ethics address what one ought to do to fulfill one's moral duty. Being legal means complying with the laws and regulations that apply to college boards and elected officials. So you can be legal, you can be technically in compliance, but be horribly unethical. Um, going on through the handbook, uh, this kind of mirrors what ACCT talks about in terms of the responsibilities and expectations that the public has of you as trustees or regents. Uh, the public expects its leaders and representatives to uphold high standards in the performance of their duties. They really do. They really do. It may not always seem like it, but I think, I think your constituents, I think the people in, uh, the, the, in, in the public expect each and every one of you to operate uh, up to the highest uh, level of ethics. Um, this talks about how the Western Association, because it's obviously California, but the, the, the WAX, is that what they call it? Dr. Lewis? Uh, they just call Western. Western Association, okay, not Sachs. Uh, uh, but, you know, they, they all require uh, boards of trustees to have uh, codes of ethics. Um, and here, you know, codes of ethics uh, define specific expectations for board members. It's important for the boards to clarify for themselves, the college, and the community what behavior you think is appropriate. It's not enough to assume that just because something is legal that it's ethical or that everyone knows how they're supposed to act as board members the minute that they are elected or appointed to the position. Codes of ethics put it down in writing what the oughts are of trusteeship. Uh, they usually address board rules and responsibilities and trustee conduct. So board roles represent the common good. Trusteeship is an expression of civic leadership and citizenship. Governing boards derive their authority from and are accountable to the community as a whole. As public officials, trustees fulfill the core value of responsibility to society by acting on behalf of the entire community. They express the value of benevolence by seeking well-being of the entire community, and they represent the interests of the community in their board decisions. Student success. I've been talking about that this morning, this afternoon. The college's purpose is to educate students and produce people who contribute to society. Boards should expect their members to uphold the welfare and success of students as a primary concern. They should expect themselves to focus on mission and goals of the college in their meetings. Board is a unit. One of the most basic tenets of effective trusteeship is the recognition that governing authority rests with the entire board, not with any individual trustee. As individuals, trustees have no authority to direct staff, determine programs and procedures, or to represent the college. And ethical trustees do not try to do so. Um, I know that in some sense for, for you, I'm the preacher and you're the choir, right? But again, um, let me just tell you, uh, 
it bears repeating again and again and again. The board's voice is expressed through the policies and actions it takes in its official meetings. Once the board has decided a policy or position, a trustee must be prepared to support it publicly. It is unethical to try to use authority independently from the board to speak out against or to try to sabotage a board decision. Making decisions, making ethical decisions means applying core values in decision making. Making good decisions also means seeking and considering all available facts and perspectives. It means studying and asking questions to clarify board agenda materials. Being ethical and responsible to the public means not making any promises about how one will vote prior to discussions at open meetings. Special interests. Single and special interest groups play an important role in representing various segments of our diverse society, such as political parties, racial and ethnic groups, employee associations, religious groups, neighborhood associations, taxpayer groups. While all of these interests are important, trustees must remember that the first and foremost obligation of every trustee is to represent the general interests of the college ser college's service area. Ethical behavior involves being aware of a wide variety of public and community needs and integrating them into the interests of the whole. I think even though there are some of you that represent or that are elected within single member districts and there are some of you that are at large as a body, I think you all do a very good job of always remembering that you represent the community as a whole. Policy making. Board responsibilities include establishing policies that direct the operations of the college and assuring that the college performs according to policies. Ethical trustees engage wisely in policy making and respect the delegation of authority to the chief executive, your college president, to administer the college. Problems occur when boards and trustees become involved in the day-to-day -day operations and try to second guess or direct staff activities. Although often well-intentioned, these acts are disrespectful of the college of chief of the college and its chief executive. So this is, the, I think this is the new correct updated uh, uh, citation. This is from the latest uh, Sachs resource uh, manual and this is the, what's been quoted to you before by Dr. Lewis, which I've talked to you about before, that uh, Sachs looks at it this way. There is a clear and appropriate distinction in writing and in practice between the policy making functions of the governing board and the responsibility of the administration and faculty to administer and implement policy. Your job is to develop policy. The administration's job is to effectuate that policy. And that's what they check for when they come on this uh, very intensive uh, SACS review. And that's what one of your, I'll just say one of your colleagues up to the north, uh, up Highway 37, uh, you know, um, and you can, it, it's, 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 in the, it's in the newspapers. I mean, I mean, it was reported, they talked about it, how they had an issue with not understanding this exactly. And so they were, they were you know, Sachs came down and gave them a, a, an initial not so good report card. Things have been fixed and they're well on their way to going forward. But it, um, I remember it was at my, a couple of, uh, Texas Association of Community College Attorney conferences ago where somebody from that area, an attorney from there was saying, what is this, who is this Sachs? I think that may have been where you spoke, Dr. Lewis. They want to know who Sachs was and what, what they thought they were doing coming down here and telling us what to do. Well, they, they found out. So this is very important. Uh, trustee conduct. Civility, decorum, and consideration for others. Remaining courteous and open-minded and treating others with honesty, decency, and respect are characteristic of ethical trustees. Ethical trustees practice responsible self-restraint and set a good example for others by communicating thoughtfully and representing the college well in their interactions with others. They avoid bitter arguments and use courteous, non-inflammatory language at board meetings. Again, you all conduct yourselves, uh, I'm proud to say, with civility and decorum in, 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 when you're in this meeting. And, and I think that reflects well for not only the board, but for the college. You are setting the tone. I can't emphasize that enough uh, because you know that there are other institutions where they have issues at the board level. And that, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, infects everything else. It trickles down and infects everything else. Consideration for others means speaking well of others in public. Now I know that, uh, you know, I got 
I got the same advice from my mom that many of you probably got from yours. If you can't say something nice about somebody, just don't say it. But if you can say somebody something nice about somebody, you know, go ahead and say it. But criticizing or belittling other trustees, college staff, or community members hurts the reputation of the entire board. Board CEO relationship. Respect, reliability, trustworthiness, and justice are all key values in the board CEO relationship. Special ethical concepts include committing to thoughtful, thorough CEO search processes, fair and attractive contracts, no surprises, and clear differentiation of roles, delegation, and direction. This is best borne out every year in the evaluation you do of the one employee that you do directly supervise and that's your college president. Open communication. This is important because we've had a conversation about this before. All board members as well as the CEO are responsible for maintaining an open, cooperative environment and promoting a free exchange of information at the board meetings. So go back. I should have put a refer back to, you know, where do you act, where are you authorized to act at the board meeting. And so absolutely, you should have a free exchange of information. I know Mr. Watts is fond of that, and that's, that's a, something you ought to subscribe to. You should have a free exchange of information here at the board meetings where you uh, are authorized to act. Trustee deliberations are characterized by fairness and open and impartial processes for gathering and evaluating information. Trustees are honest and straightforward in civil and respectful ways. Communicating with staff and students. The board and CEO should discuss and reach agreement on protocols for trustee contact with other college administrators, faculty, and classified staff members. Ethical trustees support the authority of the CEO position and respect established lines of communication. You've done that. Your rules, your bylaws, and your policies spell out how th that any communication that you want to direct at staff should go through the college president. Student and employee complaints to trustees should be referred directly through appropriate channels or to the chief executive officer. Every community college has or should have procedures that provide for fair treatment of students or employees. We do, and that's exactly the channel that you should follow. Communicating with community members and media. This has also come up. The code of ethics may include statements about protocols for communicating with community members and media personnel. They usually state that individual trustees do not speak for the board unless specifically delegated to do so. You have that in your policies. And they refer and or follow up with community members through appropriate channels. Here's why that's important. Because they ensure reliability of information and they respect the board as a unit and the roles of those designated as spokespeople for the college. Function as a team member. Being a good, good board member requires the ability to function as part of a team. Board members differ in personality, motivation, knowledge, attitude, experience, background, community stature, and capability. Differing points of view help develop alternatives, stimulate the imagination, and lead to creative solutions. Being open to and respectful of other members' viewpoints are skills that are necessary to reach consensus. Trustees often bring specialized knowledge to the board by virtue of their backgrounds and professions. However, trustees are not on the board to be experts in their fields. They are there to represent broad community interests and do not play other roles while acting, while acting as a trustee. We've covered this, you know this, um, but you must maintain confidential what needs to be maintained confidential. Most of what you do takes place right here transparently in your open meeting. However, there are going to be those occasions where you are authorized under Texas law to go into closed session to discuss sensitive matters, sen sensitive matters that are determined to be confidential. And, and that is very important because if you, um, if you leak information or disclose information or speak out of school and talk about something that should remain confidential, uh, you got the L word. You have potential liability. <clears throat> Commitment. There's a great deal to learn about the role of trustees in the governing board, the colleges, and educational issues and trends. This learning requires much time, effort, and thought. It is irresponsible to take on the trustee role without devoting time and attention to learning and performing the responsibilities. Uh, compensation and expenses. Trustees should accurately account for their expenses and follow local protocols and laws about receiving compensation of any kind. There should be appropriate reimbursement criteria and procedures which define fair reimbursement for trustee expenses. 
Ethical trustees always ask themselves if their expenses are authorized, legitimate, direct, and reasonable. Okay, consequences of violating the code of ethics. They mentioned their accreditation standard, but we have the same one. You are subject to the same accreditation standard. You must have a policy that addresses violations of the code of ethics, and you do. And the statement should address steps to address potential or actual violations of ethic laws, uh, as well as the board's own expectations for behavior. You can put a checklist by that, because you do that already. Dilemmas and unethical conduct. Again, this is also out of the handbook. But is, we're winding up here, and I think, I think this, this kind of goes to the heart of some of the frustrations sometimes that you, know, you may feel as a regent because you, know, you feel passionately about something and, and, you, and you want everybody else to see it your way. Uh, well, living by ethical standards is not always easy. Everyone may be seduced at times into being less than he or she can do can be due to self-interest or the perceived need to advance single interests and the difficulty of fully respecting those with whom one disagrees. And boards may be faced with ethical dilemmas and conflicting values. Dilemmas can occur on boards when one ethical course of action may mean that another ethical value is not upheld. Resolving ethical dilemmas requires board members to engage in often very difficult discussions to determine which ethical values are most important in a specific situation. The criteria for decision making often are those which uphold the public good and what is best for the community and college as a whole. So whatever your personal value system is and whatever you think your position is, ultimately you should match it up against that question. Am I upholding the public good and is, the, is this in the best interests of the community and the college which I serve? Unethical trustee behavior includes many activities such as independently pursuing pet projects, breaking confidentiality or not devoting time to the role. These activities hurt the college. Unethical trustee behavior can lead to loss of public support. It has caused problems in the reaccreditation re process. Community members and legislators lose faith in the college and may be more reluctant to support funding for the institution. Trustees who act unethically fail to fulfill their fiduciary responsibility to protect the value of the college. So your fiduciary responsibility is not just watching the budget, not just supervising the college president, but it also means to act ethically. Uh, well, I wanted to cover this under your board bylaws, the duties and responsibilities. Uh, th there is a censure provision, but we also have a removal provision which cites the specific uh, components of Texas law. Um, you are elected. You are elected and you do not have the authority or the ability to remove one another in this state for that reason. But there are state laws that do apply to you under the Texas Local Government Code and those are the sections here and I'm going to go over those where you could be removed as a public official. The general grounds for removal, an officer may be removed for incompetency, official misconduct, or intoxication on or off duty caused by drinking an alcoholic beverage. That's Texas law, that's what it says, and, and pretty straightforward. Incompetency means either gross ignorance of official duties or gross carelessness in the discharge of those duties, uh, or unfitness or inability to promptly and properly discharge official duties because of a serious physical or mental defect that did not exist at the time of the officer's election. Now, I can tell you that there are very, very few reported cases out there that define this or that deal with this. So it means one of two things. Either Texas public officials have been acting incredibly ethically for you know a long time, or <laughs> if you don't want to believe that, it's just that it's very difficult to bring a case like this and to actually get it into court, and, and I'm going to show you why. So I think it's the latter and not the former. Uh, Un official misconduct is defined as the intentional unlawful behavior relating to official duties by an officer entrusted with the administration of justice or the execution of the law. The term includes an intentional or corrupt failure, refusal, or neglect of an officer to perform a duty imposed on the officer by law. So if you didn't do your job as a regent, uh, you could be uh, uh, accused of engaging in official misconduct. Now here's how it works. Under section 87.015 of the local government code, 
a written petition for removal must be filed in a district court, state district court, in which the public officer that's being uh, charged with uh, incompetence or official misconduct resides, and it can be filed by any Texas resident who has resided in the county for at least six months. The petition must set forth the grounds, and petition means a lawsuit. It's an actual document that gets filed with the court. It must set forth the grounds alleged for the removal of the officer in plain and intelligible language and must cite the time and place of the occurrence of each act alleged as a ground for removal with as much certainty as the nature of the case permits. Okay, so um, in sum, in, and there's going to be a second half to this, and you will see that I'm going to cover with you in closed session, so please stick around for that. So I'm not going to be done when we finish here with the ethics presentation. But um, I think it's just important to, in some, you know, point out that when you all talk about ethics and when you, when you cite and point to your, your code of ethics and your bylaws, that you are not alone. These are the best practices uh, across the country. This is how community colleges that are doing their job, uh, you know, uh, 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 how, how, you know, how they handle their regents' ethics and, and their board's ethics. Um, you know, the fact that, that uh, the ACCT, you know, which is, which is actually just a guide and, and intended to, to get boards to, to do their own thing like you have, so it's not as robust as what you have, but the fact that the Association of Community, Community College Trustees puts that out as a national guide and the fact that the, in California, you know, they have a very, very extensive, you know, well-written guide for ethics and that you all are doing the exact same thing means that you're not alone, okay, and that the rules that you have set up for yourself are, are not intended to pick on any one of you, uh, but you're just doing what constitutes good practices. I've also given you uh, a little bit of Texas law on how, you know, public officials are removed, and so now I'm open for any questions. I went through that pretty fast, but... I wanted to get through it. I have a question, I'll give you. Um, in that last time we met in that committee, we decided to do away with the committee structure as far as the members go, and it's still in our policy. Why is that? Do you, I think the bylaws provide that the bylaws. may. We may. We, we may. may. It's, a, it's discretionary. Did so we it's change, did we change the language to specify that, or no. it's always been that way? It's always been that way. It's always been that way. Okay. But we leave it in there so we have the right to, to constitute a committee if we need to. Right. Well, but I think the discussion at the board level was, and several times we've checked this out, we've asked, are you all still comfortable with that structure? Do you want to try to go into working committees? And every time we've talked about it as a board, it was a fairly strong consensus that we wanted to operate as it was now so we didn't have uh, duplicate meetings. And things like that. But it's always open. I mean, you know, I, I think, I, I think it, you right. can always bring it up for discussion. And as a board and, and decide to go in a different direction if you want. I'll give that last presentation was great. It wasn't in our, our board book, so could you just email that to all the regents? Absolutely. Um, I will do that. And then just to go over what is in your file, that your little file folder that says, you know, ethics update 2018, so from now, and then next year will be 2019, and, you know, so on and so forth. You've got the board policy, I mean, the college policies, you know, B2.1.2. You've got copy your bylaws. You've got the code of ethics. This I actually, you know, again, when we're completely done, I will ask you to sign and, and, and turn in. And we, uh, we can sign it now if you wanted sure. to, right? And turn sure. it in. Okay. You're ready to commit? We want, commit. we want this before you leave today. Okay. Uh, I also uh, included something that Dr. Fernando Gomez, who's the uh, general counsel for the Texas State University System, some of you may know him. I've gotten to, to know him. He's, uh, he's a great fellow. He uh, regularly at the Higher Education Coordinating Board Leadership Conference talks about Regent Trustees and Duties. And so it's a very nice little outline form. Again, it, it, it commemorates and duplicates what you all are doing in large part, but it's, again, further corrobor corroboration that you're doing the right thing. And finally, um, this Green Ethics Handbook, okay, is something that Alamo College has for their employees. And in talking to the board chair about a handbook, um, the I, I wanted to just pitch the idea of 
you know, whether you all would be interested in having a regent's handbook put together, not the 200 page magnum opus that uh, they do in California, but just something for your own, for your, for your own reference and for your own resource. And so I throw that out there as, a, as, a, as something that we can have as a takeaway for this. And that's why I went through all these different components. Okay. Great. Thank components. you, Augie. Okay. We're going to move the agenda along because we're running a little bit uh, long. And we have, uh, I'm going to switch uh, agenda items in order to accommodate some students that are here. Uh, we're going to cover next item number six, discussion and possible action related to student services fee, Dr. Silva. Good afternoon, Regents. I'm uh, bringing before you today a proposal from the uh, Student Fee Advisory Committee. The Student Service Fee Advisory Committee is made up of nine students. Mainly, they're uh, SGA officers, but there is a representative from the West Campus and a representative from the East Campus that sits on the committee. Their proposal is Their proposal is okay, to increase sorry. the uh, student service fees from uh, $7 to $15. In, o in order to sustain this fund for the future also, they're asking for a $1 increase every even numbered year for that. Last time they've asked for a student service increase, it was in 2007, where they went from $6 to $7. Um, the, went a little bit backwards here. The student service fee is used, the uh, student organization, student clubs, get a portion of the student service fee. So does student programming, intramural sports, uh, the Foghorn newspaper, and RTA, and speaker series. Those are some of the, of the funds that are used to, uh, to are or are supported by the student service fee. The uh, clubs have been really popular in the last seven years. They've increased from 23 um, clubs to now 57 clubs. So it's a very vibrant campus. As you can see when you walk in the Harvard Center sometimes and also at the uh, West Campus. Participation has also increased. The numbers you see before you in 2016, 23,397, uh, that's how many touches we've had. So they're duplicated numbers, but they've increased in 2017 to 34,527. So student uh, participation in various clubs and activities has increased. Some of the highlights of the Vocal Vikings, you probably heard about Vocal Vikings. They get their funding from this uh, student service fee as well. So does the program that we have with A&M uh, Corpus Christi, uh, MLK. And the annual student recognition ceremony, that's a program that we have at the end of the year. We honor a Hall of Famer. <coughs> we also honor uh, faculty members at this event also. It's very popular. Dr. Silva, yes, the Vocal yes, Vikings are our debate and, and forensics team. Yes, sir. Team. I'm sorry. Yeah, the Vocal Vikings are... A, a it's not a singing group team. or anything like that. No, they're not singing. We, we would not be opposed to that. We're just saying. <laughs> well, no, not yet, and not yet. Maybe after this comment, so there might be. But <laughs> just want to just want to distinguish yes, them yeah, between yeah. a singing Thank a you singer. for that. Yeah, yeah. The vocal Viking, they, they represent us really well. I like bubble really students. Well. Viking, you know, you got to. Yeah, we have to yeah. clarify that. Yes, sir. And thank just you. Just to, to give you an example of um, the other student <laughs> service fees in our region, Alamo College, colleges they uh, have a one dollar per credit hour fee. I understand from Ms. Cage, her colleague just contacted her recently, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Cage, but I think they're going up to $4 an hour. That's the proposal they're going to have. And then they're up, and after that, $2 every other year. So is that correct, Ms. Cage? Yes. Okay. So her, her colleague, yeah, Ms. Cage, here, Ms. Cage. Um, Victoria College has no student service fees. Coastal Bend College, they have a $48 per semester fee. South Texas College has a $4 per credit hour fee. And so these are, are, uh, co are confusing. Some are per credit hours and some are per semester. By educational code, you could do one or the other as a community college. What, what is ours per semester? Or right, per now it's per, right now it's per semester. Per so semester. At right now it is $7 per semester, and the proposal by the Student uh, Fee Advisory Committee is to go to $15. So this example really just shows how even going to $15, we're still going to be really low as we, as we compare ourselves to our colleagues. Currently at $7. How much is raised? Approximately. Sure. How much money is raised at at, at seven dollars? Oh, it's about two hundred twenty thousand dollars. Two hundred twenty thousand dollars, and the fee is regardless whether you're part time or full time. Correct. It is by by semester. So. That that's our fee that we the structure we have here at Delmar College. So if a student is taking three hours, he has to pay seven dollars. If he's Correct. taking Correct. fifteen hours, he still pays. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. It is per semester how, how it's charged here, not per hour. What what students don't pay that fee? 
a dual credit does not pay that fee. Yeah. And that's twenty two percent of them. Sure. That's twenty two percent of the students. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Dual credit does not pay that fee. And then uh, well, of course I think C students do not pay that that, that fee. Continuing education students. Continuing education yeah. students do not pay those fees, yes. Do you have a budget that goes along with this this fee? Yes. yes, they do. Okay. They, they, they do. And and just with me is uh, Beverly Cage. She's our director of campus life and student leadership. And also John Buford. John is a very active student on campus. He is the president of our SGA as well and obviously sits on the student advisory, student fee advisory committee. So he's here also to speak on behalf of the students and Ms. Cage on behalf of student, uh, student life. I think it's important to reiterate that this is a student initiated fee okay uh, about two or three weeks ago uh, dr sila called me and said that students had approached him i'll let them speak here but i just want you to know from my standpoint that's how it came um we acted immediately it was after the february board meeting otherwise we would have put it into that meeting but uh, we're reacting as quickly as we can and responding to the students request absolutely what is the average age of a delmar student 24. 24. And of the Delmar students, do you know or can you estimate what percentage actually would get advantage of this fee? I mean, how many students just come to school and go to work and are raising families and how many actually participate in clubs and extracurricular? And that's a difficult question to answer, and I'll, I'll let Ms. Cage answer the question next, but it, it is, we are commuter schools, so we do understand some students go from the parking lot to the classroom, back to the parking yeah. lot, but there's various ways to get involved on, with student uh, activities. Uh, one of the programs they have even just handing out what they call the, uh, the, the scantrons and blue books at the end of a semester, so where students are taking tests. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead and speak, John. I, I just, I just, I was just saying that um, we pass out the blue books, scantrons, all semester long. Every day, any student on campus is allowed comes by the Student Leadership Campus Life office, and they can get their blue books or any scantrons. And we carry all the different scantrons. We've made sure we keep any scantron that a professor carries. We do have, and so they can come both, by and get it. That's at both the East and the West campus. And to your question, all students take advantage of the Student Service Fee Fund merely by the fact that they always use the scantrons and the blue books and also we pay the rta service for riding the bus and our ridership is up over the last eight years about 83 percent we have 132,000 roughly riders not riders but using rides riding the bus. rides, rides mm -hmm. riding the bus or anybody that picks up a foghorn yes exactly mm -hmm. Yep. I, I like that number. The number from 23 to 57, that's a very telling number. The, the, and it talks about the evolution of our student experience also. Because I know when Dr. Silva uh, came on board, that was one of the main things that I tried to impress. I said we must incre uh, increase the, the student life, the, 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 yeah, the, the academic, what, what do we call it, the collegiate experience. I remember that Here. So 23 to 57, that's not individuals. Those are clubs. Those are team. Those are, uh, that, that is a lot. I had no idea. Uh, to be honest with you, I knew, it, I knew it increased, but I didn't realize that much. You're busy. <laughs> well, I know that, and, 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 it, and it, it, extremely busy. I see it, and I hear it from the students on a regular basis. It has definitely changed. The number of 2000, from 2016 to 2017 also talks about production. In other words, um, participation touch points and stuff. That, that, that is an amazing number right there. And a lot of our clubs are based on their major. Mm -hmm. And so from those majors, they're mm -hmm. also members of the National Society of whatever academic, um, what academics they're involved in. So those different organizations have workshops, conferences that are usually not in this area. So by using these student service fees, they're able to go and attend these conferences, which enhances their academic um, learning all over. And one of the things that, I'm sorry, Dr. Smith. Well, I was just going to say before, I, I'll forget, Dr. Smith, let me jump, jump in there, because this is an exciting topic. And one of the things that we can count on is these students are going out and reaching out to other students. See, this is not a this is not an end. This is a beginning, I think, or this is part of the evolution. These clubs, that's why we went from 23 to 57. Because when we had 23 and we got things excited there, they went out to the others. So to your point, Regent Rivas, you're talking about the percentages of students and the types of students and who's paying and who's not. The idea is to get out there 
And these students, and by, by, by increasing to 57, that is 57 more units that have more people to reach out and have more touch points to bring in more students. I would, I would we, we don't even have to ask for the students to go out and recruit other students because that's all they're doing. And I know because I know John very well, and I know we talk all the time about these sorts of things. And why don't you add, Dr. Escamilla, these students of this club do a great job in representing us out in the community. They do a lot of civil civic engagement. I mean, we talked about Viking that. volunteers we and brought that up, and we're really proud of the work that they're doing. That Ms. Cage is really leading the effort and nudging them to go out there in the community and represent yeah. us. And again, the reason why we didn't bring this to you in February because it wasn't on our agenda, frankly. It wasn't on our uh, um, on our list of things to do for February. The students have to initiate this as per law, and we went back and reviewed all that. So basically, it's of the students, by the students, for the students. All you need is technically our approval okay. for that. Great. John, will you take a second before we see if we've got a motion to introduce the rest of your student leaders that are here today? Oh, yes, sir. Um, can you go ahead and stand right there? The, the three others that are here with us, they're all with um, the Student Leadership Campus Life Office and SGA. Um, we have Philip, who has currently served probably three semesters with SGA now. Um, he, along with myself, will be graduating. But he is our historian. Mm -hmm. um, we have, are, you're doing, in, yeah, no, no, but you're doing NSLS right now, right? Mm -hmm. We have um, Tiffany. She's with the National Society of Leadership and Success, but she also works out of our office. Um, and she is interested in coming to the SGA, and we're hoping to see her take over when we leave. Mm -hmm. And then we have Julia. Um, she's currently serving as our treasurer with SGA. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Regents, do we have a motion on this matter? Uh, I move that we accept the recommendation. We have a motion from Susan Hutchinson to accept the recommendation from the student government leadership and a second by Sandra Messbarger. Any additional discussion by Regents? Any public? So one, one, one more question. Why do we go so long without raising the fee? I think, let me. Why do we wait eight years to do a new website? I'm fly, so you're having fun. Yeah. 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 When you're having fun. Regent, yeah. Regent Rivas, I think because I've, I've been in place longer than the, the three standing up there because I have a strong idea about that. It's because we, we finally, in my opinion, it's because we finally got that critical mass of student involvement. That's what's changing everything. That's my opinion, and I dare say my professional opinion. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions, Regents? Uh, does the motion include the proposal to increase a one dollar increase every even numbered years? It, it, yeah. It's their recommendation, so it would be whatever was stated okay. in our packet. Correct. Correct. Good clarification. Thank you. Other questions or clarifications? Just, just to clarify this, this is something that is coming from the students. Is that correct? Not from the administrators or from anybody else. Let John speak uh, answer that question. Yes, ma'am. Make we, sure. Just we, to make we, sure. We did send out emails for all students. We had a mass email sent out. Um, we did hold an SGA meeting in which we read the entire proposal to the body that showed up, and we took comments from those students. Uh, we took any feedback from those students, and then we also talking around campus, and so. Um, everything we got was positive feedback. In fact, we had one gentleman in the past SGA meeting asking why we were so much lower and would this bring us up to that point. And that's the reason we're talking about that extra dollar to finally get us up to a point where our clubs are not struggling to participate in different things because they don't have the money. And, you know, they're trying to do the money with bake sales. And so this would give them the ability to go out and go to those conferences and stuff. And it was the students who proposed the $15 from 7 to 15 Yes, ma'am. And that's, we read the proposal just like that, and it was sent to emails. I think um, Dean exactly. Sanders' office did a um, DMC all to all students, show, giving them the proposal and uh, advising them of the SGA meeting. So this is going to be close to half a million dollars. Is that right? Who's got discretion over the expenditures? Uh, Ms. Cage does. Okay. A lot of money. <laughs> yeah, big part of my plan is spend it on the students every dollar. <laughs> And, and it doesn't pay for any of your salary. It's only for, see, see yeah. so the support services that Beverly provides are, are covered under the college's yeah. employment. And then so it's directly, it, it's 100% for students. 
Related to that, though, there's there's policies and procedures and guidelines. There's it's not it's not just discretionary dollars. It's all spent within the existing policies and procedures. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It, it, yes. I mean, and just to share a story, as John mentioned, the students and when they struggle to, you can only have so many bake sales to earn several thousand dollars to go, you know, to a conference, or you can only have so many bake sales when your um, final state exam is $700 and you can't pay for it because you don't have the means to do that. So you're trying to make sure that I have several clubs that they only save their money for two years until they're ready to graduate to be able to, to divide the money up amongst the members to help pay for their state exam. And that's 700 to to $1,000 that the students are paying out of their pocket, out of their pocket. And so these funds will help them meet the funds that they raise to help match to match their funds to help the students be able to do some of the things that they want to do i wanted to add to, to address uh region estrada's comment in that last month when we brought from the administration the fee schedule and everything and asked for an increase in tuition we did not include this because it comes directly from the students and this is directed through the state of Texas education code. So it's in law that this is a fund, these funds go to student services only for student services. And it's directed by the student leadership. And if I read you instead I kind of asked the same questions knowing that we just increased tuition. Asked them, are you sure you wanted to do this? And Correct. It was and that is my biggest concern. I, I thought that was. And there is absolutely. Well, weird. it's interesting it's coming up today, a month later, so it's well after all of the. Hoopla about the, the tuition increases. Does this flow through our budget? Yeah. No. It so it's not. it's a it's separate not, fund account that we did. It's an auxiliary account. It's an auxiliary account. It's a separate Got it. auxiliary account for the students. Is it and is that included included in any of our audit services? Yes, it's audited. So it is covered. That may be your question the to you. Mm -hmm. So it's a big number, but it's also there's there's policies okay. and procedures, as Carol pointed out. There's an audit of it. There's other things to ensure integrity. I, I'm going to make a prediction. If this is approved and so forth, you're going to see more clubs popping up all over, and it's going to get more and more competitive, and those dollars are going to get stretched further and further. So mm -hmm. that's just the way it works. Last right. year at the one of the SGA meetings, one of the students came in to bring up um, that the gym is not open during afternoon hours and evening hours and Saturdays for the students because normally they don't get out of class until 2.30 and the gym I think closes at like 5.30. And so Dr. Phillips brought us a proposal to be able to staff the gym with a supervisor and student workers and a lifeguard would be about $30,000. So that would have to come out of student service fee funds to be able to pay for that to provide those evening services to the students. Just Regents. one more oh, question. Just, just to make sure that we're doing the right thing. If a student were to come to you and tell you we'd like to attend this particular conference, the college wouldn't pay for it at all, correct? It would come from student funds. From okay. the student service fee funds, the $7 that they pay, or soon to be 15 but it would, they would come to you through a club. Yes. 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 It's not just an individual sure. student. That's correct. That's in, correct. In order for a club. Through yeah. the association of a club. In order for the club to request the funds, they have to file what we call an event paper. They have to file it saying this is what they want to do. Um, and then it's reviewed by Student Leadership Campus Life. And it could even come to the SGA, uh, SGA depending on what they're requesting but they do have to request it and give reasoning behind the request. It can't just be, oh, we just want to go out of town. I mean, it has to be something related to their degree or something that benefits them as a student or a leader in the community. Um, so it's not just a discretionary, yeah, we need money to go out of town. They do have to have it approved through Student Leadership Campus Life. To be honest with you, I came to this board meeting thinking, you know, oh, darn, you know, we just increased the tuition now. They're asking us to increase the student activity fee. But, you know, I, I'm all for students, and if this is what they want, you know, I'll, I'll support I that. think it's a key point of a, I mean, not to apply pressure on it. If you vote against this, you're voting against what the students are saying they want. Correct. I mean, that's the way I look at it. 
Correct. But I'm but I'm concerned that we're looking at what a, a certain percentage of students want. Well, the idea is to grow that percentage from my perspective, and that's what we've been doing. And so that's how I would respond to that. You know, um, Gabe, it's, it's sort of like national politics. If you don't vote or express your opinion, then probably you've lost your right to vote. Yeah. I mean, your, vo your voice didn't count. So if students, did it, they all got an email. If they didn't choose to respond, then guess what? They should have responded. Right. We did make sure it went out twice. We didn't just do it the day before and then have the meeting. So everybody that responded, responded positive? Everyone who's responded Everybody. responded positive, and all those that attended the meeting responded positive. Can you give me a number of how many responses? That actually responded at the meeting, I can tell you there was 10 that showed up to the meeting, and all of them were positive with everything they said. Yeah. Um, as far as who's responded to Dean and, Sanders and, or anything, I wouldn't know. And, and the poll uh, from the email, how many responded to that? That I don't know. But it wasn't requiring a it response. Requiring. No. It was an informational. It's it an informational only. Yeah. Respond Depending if you have concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the students well, were aware of this then? Yes. yes. We'll be okay, Gabe. I'm just concerned with the, with well, the adults here's, that come here's, to school, go to work, trying to raise a family, and we just hit them with a big tuition increase, and now we're doing a, a, another fee. Yeah. But you know. I'd just like to add also that on the um, notification of students, we have ensured that it's ran uh, in the foghorn for the past two issues. And today's okay. it is on the front cover of the foghorn. Okay. So we, we've made sure we've got the information out there to the student to let them know what we were pro proposing to do. Yeah. Okay. And I feel like if there was uh, 10 students that didn't like it, they'd be right there today. No, they're probably working. We, we, we also. They would have made, if it was that, yeah. if that was going to be such a big deal, yeah. they would have come or sent someone that could come yeah. in their stead to tell us, please don't do this. We also scrutinized other colleges with these types of fees, and we asked them how that they how they process. In some cases, they didn't bring it to the board. We did. We, we, uh, our definition, our interpretation of statute and everything else was to err on the side of taking it to the board, classifying it under all fees, um, because I think there's a nuance there that left it for interpretation. I'll leave those colleges to do things they wanted that, that they wanted. We knew that this discussion would be like that, and we'd put it through this extra uh, scrutiny. I knew, but that was the right thing to do. We we probably could have gone without it. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have slept right. I wouldn't have felt right about it. But we brought it here because this scrutiny is what we believe it deserves. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that, Dr. Escamilla, yeah, because we did call several colleges and ask how they do it. And yeah. Sometimes it doesn't even go to the student service fees. It's administration moving it forward so uh, i think we did run it through all, all the scrutiny very similar to the way you do when you also raise taxes and ask for public input and you know sometimes that doesn't come as yeah. well um, but i'm really proud of the students the way they handled this it, it, they've been as you can tell john's a good example yeah. of the leadership that they've taken to follow this and make sure it was appropriate regents other questions good dialogue any public comment on uh, the motion on the table for uh, agenda item number six? Let's take a roll call vote on this, please, Tony, if you don't mind. Mr. Watt. No. Ms. Scott. Yes. Mr. Riva. Yes. Ms. Ms. Barker. Yes. Mr. McCampbell. Yes. Ms. Hutchinson. Yes. Ms. Estrada. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And thank you to the student leaders who are doing a great job of uh, awesome. representing the students. Thank you. Item number five, discussion of possible action related to closing the degree program in geography, both cultural and physical. Dr. Lewis. I have the unenviable position of standing between you and a break, so <laughs> I will be quick about this. Okay, so we offer an Associate of Arts in Physical Geography and one in Cultural Geography. We have not awarded that degree in either area for more than 10 years, and we currently have no majors in either of those fields. We have not had a full-time faculty member in that department for several years. If we keep the program as a degree awarding program, SAC COC says we have to have at least one full-time faculty member in that department. However, the enrollment in those two classes is so small, it doesn't warrant a full-time faculty member. So you understand our dilemma. We don't have majors in it. 
We've not awarded the degree in more than 10 years, and we don't have a full-time faculty member to keep the degrees. We would have to hire a full-time faculty member, but the teaching load is not large enough to warrant a full-time faculty member. Now, if you um, move or accept the motion to close those two degrees, it will not affect the course Geography 1303, which is World Regional Geography. It currently is an option for three hours of social and behavioral sciences in the 42-hour course, so anyone can take it um, in their social and behavioral science core. It is a required class for the GIS, Associate in Science degree, Geographical Information Systems. Currently, it is taught by an adjunct faculty member, and that's fine. We have that covered. So that's where we are with that class. I didn't want to leave anybody with the impression that we were doing away with that or that this was impacting our GIS program or Geographical Information System program at all. If you approve the closure, the next thing that I will do is notify the coordinating board and SAC COC of program closure. We'll remove the degree from the catalog and systems and we'll do a third look just to make sure there's absolutely no one hiding in the woodwork that is a major or that would be affected by this if if there is which we've as i said we've checked twice we'll check one more time but if there is then we'll work with that student to do a teach out program if necessary so this is coming as a recommendation from the uh, college management any questions for by any of the regents for dr lewis I'll go ahead and move to approve the closure of the geography program, Mr. Chair. We have a motion from <coughs> Rebus and a second from uh, Regent Estrada. It's, it's never easy, as you said, Dr. Lewis, to close yes. the program, but the, the, it, the, so. we're doing things by the numbers and the metrics, and, and that makes sense. Any further discussion? Any public comment? Yes, sir. Come on down, please. <clears throat> Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is James Klein, um, professor of history here at Del Mar College. I'm also the president of the Del Mar College chapter of the American Association of University Professors. Uh, and I did not hear this in uh, uh, Dr. Lewis's comments, so I just had a quick question about this. Um, uh, I wanted to be sure that this went through the curriculum committee, the faculty curriculum committee. If it has, then I have no other comment. That's my only question. It did. That's what we've been indicated. So, in other words, the, qu the question was: uh, Did it go through all pro processes and protocols for? It was vetted. Vetted. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any further public comments? Uh, all in favor of the motion uh, to uh, terminate the program, uh, signify by saying yes. 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 All opposed. Motion carries unanimously. At this point in our agenda, we have general public comments. Is there anyone here that would like to approach the uh, Board of Regents during general public comments? Oh, welcome back. Uh, good afternoon, I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Jim Klein, and, and I wear several hats here. Uh, one of those is uh, director of a group in uh, Corpus Christi called the Career Explorers Mentoring Project. We work with some middle school students over at Middle School to expose them to careers they otherwise wouldn't normally uh, be aware of. Uh, and uh, I wanted to today to um, belatedly uh, give a shout out to President Mark Escamilla for his generosity in supporting that uh, mentoring project. He's going to provide lunch for the students. They're going to go to West Campus, or we brought to West Campus this coming Friday afternoon, Friday morning and afternoon. And President Escamilla has generously, as he has for several years in a row now, uh, agreed to provide lunch for the students. So I wanted to give him a shout out. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Alex Solis, who's the recruiting officer over at the West Campus. He's done very good work with us as well, and he's going to help to organize the entire field trip project for us on Friday. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you any other public comments? Great. Uh, if you'll allow me to read the, the required language on closed session, we'll read it, and then we'll go into closed session in regions. We will take a break in between. We're going into closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel regarding pending or contemplated litigation or a settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel or pending, on pending legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. Texas Government Code 551.076, security devices or security audits regarding the deployment or specific occasions of imp for implementation of security personnel or devices or security audit with possible discussion and action in open session. It is 314. We will 
uh, dismiss and clear the room for our uh, closed session, and Regents will take about a seven minute break. Okay, we're going back into open session at 3.52 p.m. and there's no action. Um, last on our agenda is calendaring. In Regents, you should have at your desk uh, the calendar that Delia puts together for us in April. Um, two things that are not on the calendar, but on Monday, May 9th, I think I had this down correctly from earlier in our meeting. That's the beginning of National Library Week. Yes. April. April 9th. April 9th. April 9th. What did I say? May. May. Okay, I'm on April. Glad, <laughs> glad we're all caught up together. Um, I'm just so excited about National Library Week. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, I grew up going to libraries. My grandmother started, co started Lower Timer Library. I'm very proud of libraries. So, we will be celebrating National Library Week. Um, the 9th, uh, 1030, I think on the Yes. Uh, East Campus, uh, 2.30 on the West Campus would be a great chance to uh, get National Library Week kicked off. And I think it's pretty exciting that um, what they're doing is starting, starting to make the library sort of a, a center of a, of a, a social center, an activity center. What's so on the West Campus? It's a, it, I think there's two events you can either do at the 2.30 on the West Campus at the Barth or 10.30 here at the library. That's right. Okay. Uh, the 10th, April, April 10th is the board day. Yes. And uh, again, as usual, hold open from about you know 10:30 on in case we need a workshop. Uh, we're not anticipating one, but just in case. Uh, the 12th um, is Bernie's Crawfish Boil at Concrete Street at 5:30. The 27th of April is the Employee Service Awards in the Retama Room at 8 a.m. And now we're officially in the month of May on our calendar. Uh, the 8th is the Board Day, and graduation is the 11th at American Bank Center. Um, and our, I think you let us know last time our speaker, and it is Libby Averett. Correct. Which would be great. Um, and in June, um, there's the CCAC conference in um, Fort Worth on April 1st and 2nd, and then board day on the 12th. Any other calendaring items over the next few months that you'd like to bring to the attention of the board? What's yes, the date sir? for the uh, fish fishing tournament? No, not the crop. So it's June, June eighth and ninth. June eighth is the captain's party for stringers for scholarships, and then the actual tournament is on the ninth. That's Friday and Saturday. We'll write those in for next time. Okay. Okay. This is not too late, but this is late. Sorry for the late notice, but this is not too late. Tonight at six o'clock at the White Library. Professor Elizabeth Flores and the Mexican American Studies Department is screening the wonderful movie Dolores, oh, uh, Dolores Huerta. Yes. So it's an awesome six. movie. At six. At six. From six to Coco? nine. <laughs> she just bought it. <laughs> it's a little different, but but. That's uh, good. <laughs> so we went from Dolores to Coco. <laughs> That's a lot of different but no, I mean. Dolores. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but but and, and it's great because the movie has brought a lot of attention to <laughs> the topic. But of course, what that was here recently, you know, and Corpus Christi and spoke at uh, Richardson. She was wonderful. Right. For those that got to meet her, and it'd be light refreshments. Anyway, on behalf of Professor Floyd, in the Mexican American Studies Department. There you go. Any other calendaring? Hearing none, we are adjourned at 3:55 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Oh.